Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome at Goethe Institute Max Müller Bavan. My name is Katharina Görig. I am the director of the cultural program department here. So today we are here to present Navina Sundaram's live work, The Fifth Wall. The digital archive, The Fifth Wall, gathers films, reportages, moderations, texts, letters and photos by the filmmaker and editor Navina Sundaram from over 40 years of her work in German television. Navina becomes apparent as a journalist who took a stand on internationalism and decolonization, the question of class, gender, against racism and discrimination on Indian and German politics. An event that we started planning with Vivan Sundaram is happening, sadly happening without him. We at Goethe Institute are extremely saddened by his demise. He was one of our closest and long-standing partners and would always take our time for us and our projects. It is in his memory and his spirit that we take today's event forward. I would like to give a very brief introduction to the program today before I hand over to Ashish Rajaik Daksha, a um, film theorist, curator and a trustee of Shergi Sundaram Foundation. The aspect of Fifth Wall that we present today is decolonizing practices framing news, circulating archives. We are pleased to have with us Merle Kröger, novelist and film author, who along with Mareike Bernin has created this archive. Thank you. We are also pleased to have Robaika uh, Jaliwala, freelance editor and translator, who has collaborated with them for the German-English translation of the entire Fifth Wall archive. Merle and Rubaika will make a presentation about the archive, following which there will be a screening of the film Freedom and its Price by Navina Sundaram and a panel discussion with Madhushri Datta, filmmaker, curator and author, and Vincent Hediger, professor of cinema studies at Goethe University Frankfurt am Main, along with Merle Kröger, will follow. And now I hand over to Ashish. Thank you. Um, just a short note. It was uh, less than a year ago that we lost Navina on April 22nd, whose work we have gathered today to see and to hear, and whom we shall remember and celebrate this afternoon. What was not known when this event was being planned and worked towards was that by the time we got to today, this occasion, we would lose Vivan yes. as well. Present company does not need any introduction to Vivan. The biographical details, the major landmarks in contemporary Indian art that he participated in and almost always initiated, these are well known. And yet, we have been surprised at the scale of the outpouring of affection we have encountered in these past few days. Across social media, across all forms of journalism, in activist groups, across the arts, in academic circles, across disciplines, people are mourning this moment as one where they have lost one of their own. Some years ago at an exhibition celebrating Mumbai's Kemol Art Gallery at the NGMA, Vivan had put a ticker tape atop a found archive that went, quoting from memory, the archive, the hereafter of art. I'm quoting this from memory, uh, and I think memory is going to be important because I was unable to track mm -hmm. this quote down. But like so many of us, I'm relying here on memory. In so doing, of course, I am engaging in an activity that along with numerous people has required the production of a veritable archive in real time as friends have put down their personal albums, as photographers have dug into their collections to recall moments going 50 years or more. And we've seen the production of an archival condition of the present continuous that might have pleased both Navina and Vivan. A condition that speaks of the past but also the enduring afterlife of events that occurred, histories to which multiple friends, colleagues, artists near and far, and inevitably historians of this moment, the moment that we're all in, 
will return relentlessly both to what we are seeing unfolding in real time before us. It is worth remembering then that even as we mourn Vivan, we remember that his most recent work is currently on at Sharjah and is, like the hereafter of all art, accruing new meaning, even a prescience. That the heights of Machu Picchu, which may have been the first time that Vivan perhaps hit his creative stride, is at the moment on display at the Kochi Muzairis Biennale. And that in a very short while, his landmark memorial, his own act of ritual remembrance for another man, will be on display at the Tate Modern. That the book, Kasoli Art Center, 1976-1991, that Vivan oversaw down to its very last detail, will be out soon. And along with it, a whole series of events that Vivan conceptualized. That the Kasoli Art Center itself, which he had designed once again to its last detail, will soon be in place. That the Shergil Sundar Amats Foundation, carrying forward both Navina and Vivan's vision and legacy, has now become a fully fledged art institution with numerous plans, all conceived by Vivan or in direct consultation with him, which will keep, I think, a lot of people in this room busy for at least the next few years. It includes grants of support to photography, installation art, archival work, organizational work of various kinds, and of course, publication work alongside the extraordinary Tulika books that has set the standard for independent publishing in India for close to three decades now. Who's then to say that Vivan and Navina are not with us anymore? Can the archive and the afterlife of the historical present now play a role of memory, of mourning, and of celebration that can truly accommodate the preciousness of the present moment as we are encountering it, as they are being remembered all around us? The archive, and we one would have agreed with this line of Derrida's that continues to quote, that continues the quote, burns with a passion and the search that does not rest. There is a responsibility here, as much as there is desire, to do something that the established apparatus of remembrance, the state apparatus of remembrance, simply cannot return to, cannot handle, to return to the most archaic place of absolute commencement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks a lot. This was a very good uh, introduction to what we try to work around today. Um, I shortly introduce us again. Um, I'm, I'm Merle Kruger. As uh, Katharina said, I'm a novelist and a film author. I work uh, together with the filmmaker Philip Schaffner. I have, we have a little company in Berlin called Pong Film. <coughs> where we make feature documentary films since 2007. And in my novels, I, um, I'm trying to combine a kind of historical research, um, personal history and political analysis with elements of crime writing, so crime literature. So it means also I have a lot to do with archives and um, memories. And as a creator of the transnational cultural project Import-Export, cultural transfer between India and Germany, Austria in 2005, I began a long-term collaboration with Navina Sundaram, which uh, led to the making of this archive. I will now, um, uh, after I introduce ourselves, I will switch to the archive itself. I like this picture very much, actually. It's so nice. <laughs> Um, next to me is Rubaika Jaliwala. She's a freelance um, editor and translator of literary, literary art and cultural texts and books. She lives in Mumbai and Berlin. And as a trainer and educational advisor, she has led workshops and intercultural, uh, on intercultural learning and diversity on four continents. She has collaborated with us since 2005 and uh, for the English-German translation of the archive, she has um, done the whole um, translation really of the films, of the texts, of the reportages, and of the commentaries for the archive, as Navina wished. She always trusted Rubaika as the only person who could do this. And that's why she also recited the excerpts of Navina Sunaram's letters for audio recordings for this archive. There are persons who are not here today. And there's my colleague Mareike Benin from Pong Film, who is an artist and a film scholar herself, and who is currently preparing the first show of this archive as an installation, a kind of walk-in archive, to be presented at Hamburg International Documentary Week in the end of April. And then there are two people of 
whom just one is here today, and this is Vivan Sundaram and Gita Kapoor, who have been the first people to insist that this archive should be translated and travel back to India and South Asia. Our hearts are with you, Gita, and our thoughts are with Vivan, in whose memory this event shall be held. And at last, there's the person who is in the center of our project, and uh, this is Navina Sundaram, known as the artist Vivan Sundaram's younger sister, as painter Amrita Shergill's niece, as the co-founder of our dear host organization, SSAF. But not too many people in India might know that Navina, who passed away almost a year ago, was also a kind of celebrity and an esteemed filmmaker and journalist in Germany. So we'll uh, best let her introduce herself. So I switch now um, to this. Mm -hmm. full, full screen. And I go to full screen. Mm -hmm. So lights. Das fing immer so an. Asiatische Miniaturen. And now Wait, also, ne, oh Gott, das ist ja endlos. Also das sind auch Bilder von, von Indien, ne? wie, wie man sich das vorstellt. Das ist im Jahre 61 oder 62, glaube ich. So, Studio Neu Delhi. Ah, und jetzt kommt es. Das bin ich. Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren in Deutschland. Hier meldet sich Navina Sundaram aus dem Fernsehstudio des Norddeutschen Rundfunks in Indien. It is fitting that at this solemn moment we take the pledge of dedication to the service of India and her people. Nehru, no? And to the das ist die berühmte Unabhängigkeitsrede. The service of India ja, means the service, service of the millions who suffer. Also ich bin ein Nehru-Kind, ne? No? Da bin ich in ja, Nehru's Vision aufgewachsen in Indien. Das war ganz großartig, das säkulare so Indien. Ne? Suffering, so Noch Meine Generation kennt weder die Ach, da bin ich noch bewusst in Sari aufgetreten. Das bewusst auch einge, eingesetzt als Strategie. Ne? Wegen der Authentizität. Sie Sehr geehrte Herren, es ist ein Skandal, dass diese Sendung von einer Ausländerin moderiert wird. Diese Dame soll doch in ihr Kaffernland gehen. Die Luft ist rar. Die Luft ist rar in solchen Posten. Es ist, äh, weißt du, ich bin ja nicht als Sekretärin oder sowas äh, da gewesen, sondern in diesem redaktionellen Bereich, wo du auch äh, eine gewisse Macht ausübst. Und die Macht ist nicht eine Macht über Menschen, das interessiert mich nicht. Es ist die Macht über Programm. Macht über Mittel, um bestimmte Ideen äh, durchzusetzen. I need some light. Somebody has to be very fast. Yeah, I know. I think although Navina Sundaram presented herself quite clearly in this trailer, I want to give you a little bit of background on her and also on the archive which is structured around her films before we start our first guided tour today. Navina Sundaram worked as a tele political television editor, foreign correspondent and a moderator for the northern television channel NDR and the first public program ARD in Germany. Grown up in the independent Republic of India, Navina Sundaram studied English literature at the University of Delhi. In 1963, still being a student, she was asked to moderate the broadcast series Asian Miniatures, Asiatische Miniaturen, which you just saw, the one with the fan. Um, This was produced in the German television studio in New Delhi, which was very uh, newly established in 1963. It was actually, she says, 1961, but it was in 1963. By now we know it better than Navina knew. And as a result, she was invited to complete a two years training in Hamburg as a television journalist at the Northern Television Channel NDR. 
So there, she continued to work from 1964 onwards, permanently employed for over 30 years. As a filmmaker, editor, and moderator, she worked for very famous programs um, as, maybe we should change, the, is it irritating? It's okay? Okay. I can otherwise change to the other mic. Um, she worked for pro yeah. I can operate with four hands. So the programs Navina worked for were called Weltspiegel, World Mirror, Gesichter Asiens, Faces of Asia, Panorama, and Extra 3, 3 special to be translated, among others. And later she was an interim ARD correspondent and head of the South Asia television studio in New Delhi. During her time at NDR, she produced numerous documentaries, reports, and commentaries on the Global South with a special focus on decolonization, as we can see today, because it's to our today's main theme, as well as on Germany with a focus on immigration, asylum uh, politics, and discrimination against foreigners, which is very interesting, I think. After leaving NDR in 2004, Navina Sundaram continued her work as an independent director of documentaries and author of numerous texts and lectures. I now go back to show you um, actually how to enter the website. Now I have to do, oops, this, okay. We type in, and this is how you all can exit it from today onwards. It's really the launch, the minus fifth minus wall dot net and then you enter the so-called landing page the online archive the fifth wall in German it's called Dif I can the problem is I can't read like this maybe one side it's a bit Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. There. Like this? Yeah. It's okay? We improvise a bit. <laughs> the, fifth, the fifth wall is a web platform, a production archive, and a work biography at the same time. It is made up of ARD holdings and Sundaram's private archive. At the center are 67 films and broadcast contributions, of which 56 are subtitled in English now, with the support of Goethe Institute and SSAF. And grouped around them, I mean like assembled around these films, are documents, letters, manuscripts, photographs, correspondences, as well as lectures. In what we call the foyer, or the landing page, um, I have to adjust to this computer, um, you'll find a collection of material. This is the trailer you just saw, photos, quotes, and a letter of her mother, uh, a letter to her mother, excuse me, from the night of the moon landing on July 21st, 1969, which also explains the name of the archive, the fifth wall. That's why I would like to play it for you. Hamburg, 21st July, 1969. Dear Mummy. I hope this gets you before you go down to Delhi. Today I'm leaving for four days to do some filming in Heidelberg. I will be back on Thursday. Slowly the shock recedes. It's extraordinary how rapidly we get used to things. Marvelous built-in mechanism without which I'm sure we'd all be neurotics. Hamburg remains a bit grim as far as the weather is concerned, but there are a few compensations. Tonight, as the three astronauts land on the moon, millions of television viewers will be watching. It's a fantastic thing. So many billions of miles away and actually, for all practical purposes, it's as far as Vietnam, which is across the room, the fifth wall. German television surpasses itself or overdoes it and broadcasts the night through. I won't be staying up, I can assure you, but I will be watching for a while. I must do some preparatory work for Heidelberg now, so look after yourself. All my love, yours, Navina. At 
the bottom of the page, um, you'll find a registration button. We skip the registration here, um, which is basically a control mechanism that Navina Sundaram insisted upon. That's why I want to mention it today, because she feared racist and right-wing interference into this archive. And we also felt it is good to have a somehow protected safe space, because it's also private material which is in there. And, um, but just to let you know, um, the registration is of course free, you are registered by email and you get immediate access to the entire archive. And we move right now directly into the interior of the archive. That's how it looks like. I will scroll down a bit and you just can watch what happens when you open the archive. As a constantly changing structure, the roots of the archive reach far into the historical and political ramifications of 20th century especially its media and television history, which is of course also contemporary and political history. Themes such as international politics in South Asia, the Cold War, gender, class issues and labor, ecology, migration and asylum policy in Germany run through the archive. In addition to this, Navina Sundaram's own experience with the field of public television as a woman and as a migrant and therefore addressing intersectionality become apparent. The archive attempts to bring together these different traces, contributions and references as a mosaic. At first glance, these materials and their different kinds of language, private, professional, stand side by side like fragments of memory. Seemingly without a hierarchy, they form an assemblage that is reassembled each time we call up the archive. So if I now call it again, I go into it, it will be a different pattern which shows, hopefully. <laughs> the objects are interrupted by black spaces. These refer um, to the fact that each um, archive is kind of uh, fragmentary. There's always gaps in it. It's not all the films Navina ever made. It's every archive, it's not all the letters she wrote back home. So it remains fragmentary as I think every archive, so we didn't want to have the impression that this is an entireness. It's always, it has holes, it has gaps. It also makes it open to other archives, right? Um, and I would like to add a small um, background note here, which is very important to us. The archive project, The Fifth Wall, is a digital work biography of Navina Sundaram, but at the same time, it's an intervention into existing archival practices. Because the archives of public television, so-called public television in Germany, are no public archives at all. It's very hard to enter if you're not a scientist or a journalist, and even then, you must already know exactly what you want in, ex in advance. Be lucky that it still exists at all, and invest a lot of money for copying purposes. In spite of all these barriers, or in fact because of them, we decided to intervene into this archival metabolism of television and extract the works um, by Navina Sundaram to make them open to the public. So this project is meant to be a role model, a kind of gate-crashing pioneer work, and um, in fact it already has become one because if we get the doors open, then others will follow. By extracting Navina's work, we did not want to take over the institutional work of public television. That's their task, right? I mean, they actually should be doing it. But we believe that her work offers a very, very specific perspective that needs to be highlighted and should not disappear. Public television in Germany and Europe in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and up to now has been a competitive largely white male world. Navina Sundaram took a very specific view in this, which was kind of unique in German television at the time and stemmed from her specific, we call it, situatedness. She called it between tree and bark. And it's a very migrant situated knowledge which she had. Between India and Germany, between here and there, between inside and outside. And this is why we call the subtitle of the archive, or she called it actually, an insider's outside view or an outsider's inside view. A perspective she shared, for example, with Roshan Dungy Boy, uh, who was also one of the few migrants and persons of color who shaped television in Germany at the time. 
And certainly there were few, um, and today are many more others, whose name we might even know yet. And we were very glad to develop this project, not isolated, but in a context called Archive Außer Sich, initiated by Arsenal Institute for Film and Video Art in Berlin, which I will refer to later during this afternoon. Just a few words now to the architecture of the archive. Um, imagine it like a shelf. It's not, um, it has not a filter for a function. So you can't take things out and then they're gone. You can just sort it by different patterns. So uh, one way to sort it is by material. As we can see here, it's sorted um, by the items films which appear first ah that's a good idea thank you then i go to photo which is below the films we we'll wait a few seconds actually oh internet internet okay it will come and um Sometimes there is, if you click on a photo, you'll see there is a whole slideshow behind it. This is, for example, the shooting of the film um, Darshan Singh wants to stay in Leverkusen. <laughs> so there's always something behind the front thing. Then we go down further and there are the uh, texts, which are not so many in English because the most texts Ravina wrote were in German. But uh, we will translate them step by step and put them, add them to the English archive as well. Um, she did a lot of lectures, articles also for German newspapers, and then some, as you can see here, also for lectures in India, which were written, of course, um, in English. Um, then we come to the letters, and the letters to me are very special and dear because it's a collection of letters written between 1964 when she came. She was 19 at the time. She came in 1964 and until 1971 um, she wrote uh, a lot of letters to her parents and to her brother, which she agreed to, to be in the, in the archive. And um, then if we go further down, there is what we call comments or commentaries. And this is uh, different interviews with Navina, in which we made in 2004 and 2018, edited in small bits and pieces. And uh, which was very important to us, we also invited other people to um, join Navina in this archive by commenting on single films. Um, we asked people who were long-time companions or colleagues of Navina, film professionals, academics, to comment. And for example, you will find here Madhushri Datta, who is today with us, and she commented on the film Portrait of a Patriot. And of course, there's Vivan Sundaram, who commented um, Navina's film on Amrita Shagil, Amrita Shagil, a family album. Another way to sort the archive is by theme, and that also um, was very important uh, to the kind of curatorial aspect of the whole thing, because the first idea was to sort um, or to create the themes um, like um, newspaper columns, you know, like politics or newspaper resorts, we call it, uh, politics, economy, culture, um, but that we felt was kind of outdated and it didn't feel appropriate. So we had a long um, brainstorming um, about how we can structure this archive from today's point of view, reflecting Navina's situatedness and her refusal to locate herself in only one place. So we tried to find themes, not from a Eurocentric angle, like, you know, politics and then the rest of, I mean, German politics and then rest of the world politics. So we decided to go um, to the themes, media, migration, international politics, decolonization, culture, human rights, racism, labor relations, gender, global economy, and of course other, uh, like in every archive there's another, an other, I guess. Then there are two more um, ways to sort the archive. Once, of course, by broadcast series, which I had already mentioned. Here you also see like Tagesschau, which is the most important news journal in Germany, which he worked for. And then there is the workspace, which to me is very important. Actually, right now there's only today's event, the fifth wall, international version launch. 
But um, this is a growing space. And until now, um, in Germany, it contains um, events, research, related research, publications. And in the next weeks and months, it will be showing paths through the archive, extracts, curatorial perspectives, educational tools like the ones Rubaika will today present to you, and additional texts. And before I hand over to Rubaika for this first uh, thematic walk along the axis of decolonization, I'd like to end on a personal note today. And um, I want to do this with a letter. So I go to letters. This is one of the last letters in our little collection here from 23rd July 1971. And I open it for you and I read a part of the letter to you. Dear Vivan, that I shall return to India was perfectly clear to me. The question yet unanswered is when? To be frank, your returning to India had a lot to do in strengthening my resolve to do the same. We have developed, and I'm glad, a close and mature relationship that is intellectually and emotionally mutually rewarding. And it is with your help that I feel I shall be able to break the isolation that I normally find surrounds me when I'm in India. This isolation is undoubtedly self-imposed. You are a much stronger character than I am in many ways. Your involvement goes far deeper, and your organizational talents are more effective. I've always required someone to give me the initial push, and I need it in Delhi with its strongly incriminated past more so than elsewhere. I usually function in a given setup, more so if it conforms with my political and social ideas, and less if it doesn't. I'm not good at organizing something that doesn't exist from scratch. And political awareness is something that can become blunted if it's not continuously educated. For us in the Indian context, this political and social awareness is constantly theorized. As you said, the main problem is to decolonize and declass oneself. Part of the problem is, I think it was Engels who said, one can only betray one's class <coughs> but not leave it. It was this conflict of the privileged class with all its intellectual and monetary trapping and the unprivileged and the tremendous overpowering dichotomy between the two that flummoxed me when I was in India. Admit it, I don't know how to combat it in political terms then and I'm not quite sure I know now. But I think I know vaguely the direction it has got to take and the vital importance of collective action. So you see I'm tapping around in the dark. I'm perfectly aware that to live on in Germany would make me forever a fringe existence, working on the periphery of this society. I cannot identify with this country and never will. The problems in India are too enormous to allow me to do so. And my awareness of being Indian, despite the fact that I do not speak an Indian language, that I have not li lived life as Indian, whatever that identity may be, that I am of a class that is deeply colonial and exploiters. Despite all these things, I'm aware of a commitment to India. Thank you. Yeah. She was, I think, 27, no, 24 at the time she wrote this letter. So now I hand over the mic to my friend. <coughs> Thank you, Mala. So as Mala presented, uh, the fifth wall is a treasure trove of material comprising films, reportages, texts, letters, and photographs. So it's a tremendous resource that I have accessed to develop pedagogical tools to discuss and address themes of interculturality and diversity, gender, racism, and migration, and also to explore strategies to transform spaces and hierarchies. So I work basically um, since the past 15 to 20 years as a trainer in, uh, um, for intercultural education and anti-discrimination work. And this for me personally, and I hope for a lot of other people, is a, a tremendous tool. So this thematic walk today on decolonization is just one example of how the archive can be accessed for educational purposes. 
So over the next one hour, I will present, um, go through kind of a process and flow, um, which can be adapted when people are using it um, for education, can be adapted to different settings and contexts and target groups. Um, of course, uh, it should also be presented uh, inter in an interdisciplinary manner. Um, the film, films or film excerpts should not be used as standalones, but within a theoretical framework and uh, made more interactive so that one generates, uh, you know, gets young people to talk about these issues. So let's start now. Um, uh, the thematic work is basically, I've divided it into two segments. We'll start with the first, which is basically decolonization, the act of um, the colonialists leaving the country and going. So uh, I start with India, uh, with the film, So Long As There Are Tears. You saw an, a, a bit of it in the trailer already. Uh, it was made in 1972 on uh, the 25th anniversary of India's independence. So just let's see a little excerpt of this film. Fünfzehnter August 1947. Indien wird frei. At the stroke of the midnight hour, when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom. It is fitting that at this solemn moment, we take the pledge of dedication to the service of India and her people and to the still larger cause of humanity. The service of India means the service of the millions who suffer. It means the ending of poverty and ignorance and disease and inequality of opportunity. The ambition of the greatest men of our generation has been to wipe every tear from every eye. That may be beyond us, but so long as there are tears and suffering, so long our work will not be over. Meine Generation kennt weder die Kolonialherrschaft noch den Freiheitskampf Mahatma Gandhis. Ich bin im unabhängigen Indien aufgewachsen, das mir als Mitglied einer privilegierten Klasse alle Möglichkeiten zur Erziehung, zur Berufsausübung und zum Geldverdienen geboten hat. Was selbstverständlich war, für mich ist aber für die große Mehrheit meiner Landsleute unerreichbar. Wie alle Inder bin ich stolz auf die außenpolitischen Erfolge meines Landes, auf den wirtschaftlichen Aufschwung und darauf, dass die Einheit der Nation gewahrt wurde. Das kann mich aber nicht darüber hinwegtäuschen, dass die grundlegenden sozialen Probleme noch so ungelöst sind wie vor 25 Jahren. So that was just a little bit uh, from the film. Um, you can watch it uh, in its entirety at another time. Uh, so basically, you don't have to be like me, born at that time, uh, to know uh, Nehru's speech, for most of us who are here. Um, there was a buoyant mood at the time of independence. People had great hopes and aspirations for the future of India. The reportage goes on to tell us what the actual situation was 25 years later and uh, the various social problems uh, that uh, were still needed to be dealt with. Uh, we'll move on from there to a commentary by Navina, which is called Postcolonial Utopia, uh, Utopias, and was uh, shot in 2018. Ich bin in, uh, in Nehru's Indien uh, aufgewachsen und uh, das war auch jahrelang und prägte es immer noch. Also jetzt bröckelt es natürlich ab, weil die das war die, die, die Blockfreie, die dritte, die dritte Alternative, die hat viele Brüche und viele, aber es war zumindest etwas Besonderes da im Kalten Krieg. Ne? 
zwischen den Hat auch was stark Utopisches, finde ich, wenn man heute drauf guckt, als auf diese mhm. Bewegung der Blockfreien, die wird ja immer so ein bisschen ausradiert aus der Geschichte, gerne, wird so ein bisschen vergessen. Ja, die wird so belächelt, weil man sagt dann, naja, ist ja, äh, ist ja ähm, sozusagen, die Geschichte ist darüber hinweggegangen und... Äh, ähm, aber die war schon, schon wichtig, auch um so ein, äh, äh, weißt du, dieses Bewusstsein für das Neuerwachte, da in dem Fall war es leider ein Nationalismus, und es war aber wichtig, also die, die postkoloniale Debatte, das spielt natürlich auch mit eine Rolle, die nicht in den gleichen, also es war diese ganze Aufbruchstimmung auch, du verschaffst eine neue, ja und dann eine panafrikanische, ist alles nicht geworden, aber so gut, Utopien, wo ist was geworden, wenn man die aber nicht hat, dann kann man aufhören zu... Denken. Zu denken, <lacht> zu leben und zu, <lacht> und zu, leben und zu, und zu denken. Ja, ja. So, as Navina mentions, the postcolonial utopias were important. What emerged as a result of the newly awakened India was nationalism, which was probably very important as a unifying factor at the time, which has of course reached new heights today. From India, we now move uh, to Africa and to Guinea-Bissau. Uh, this uh, film is called The Legacy of Amilcar Cabral and was shot in 1976. Die Maschine aus Konakry kam mit Verspätung. Auf dem Flughafen Bissalanka hatte das diplomatische Korps anderthalb Stunden lang geduldig gewartet. Vertreter der Volksrepublik China, Russlands, Frankreichs, der USA, der DDR und verschiedener schwarzafrikanischen Länder, die gekommen waren, um einem ermordeten Revolutionär ihre Reverenz zu erweisen. Auf diesen Augenblick hatte das Land drei Jahre lang gewartet. Auf die Rückkehr der sterblichen Überreste Amilcar Cabrals, des Gründers der Einheitspartei und des Führers des Unabhängigkeitskampfes. Präsident Luis Cabral, der Bruder des Ermordeten und der Generalsekretär der Partei hatten gerade eine dreitägige Sitzung des höchsten Kriegsrates beendet, in der eine neue Aufbaupolitik in Friedenszeiten formuliert wurde. Die Delegation aus Conakry, geführt von der Frau des chinesischen Präsidenten Sekuture, war hier in doppelter Funktion, um den Sarg Amilka Cabrals heimzugeleiten und um sich über die Beschlüsse zu informieren. Die Beziehungen der beiden Nachbarländer sind besonders herzlich. Von Conakry aus wurde der Befreiungskampf im früheren portugiesischen Guinea geführt. Dort arbeitete die gesamte Parteispitze, so auch Amilcar Cabral, bis zu seiner Ermordung 1973. Erst jetzt, zum 20. Jahrestag ihrer Gründung, glaubte die Partei, den Toten gebührend empfangen zu können. Amilcar Cabral wurde Opfer eines Komplotts des portugiesischen Geheimdienstes. Ausgeführt wurde die Tat allerdings von Parteigängern aus der Umgebung Cabrals. Die Begegnung mit der Geschichte war schmerzhaft. Luis Cabral weiß, dass das Attentat nicht zuletzt auf Differenzen im gemeinsamen Befreiungskampf der Kapverden und Guinea-Bissau zurückzuführen war. Heute, zwei Jahre nach der Unabhängigkeit, stehen die Kapverden und Guinea-Bissau kurz vor dem Zusammenschluss beider Nationen. Der Schock der Ermordung Amilcar Cabrals hat mit dazu beigetragen. Für diese Kinder ist der ausgediente Panzerwagen nur noch ein Abenteuerspielzeug. In einer ehemaligen portugiesischen Kaserne am Stadtrand von Bissau sind 200 Kriegsweisen untergebracht. 
Im Zuge der allgemeinen Demilitarisierung hat man eine andere Verwendung für militärische Einrichtungen gefunden. In der Großküche des Kasernen-Waisenhauses rührt man den Kochtopf auf traditionelle Weise. Draußen verrosten moderne, teilweise noch verpackten Gulaschkanonen, eine der wenigen Hinterlassenschaften der Portugiesen. Es fehlen Fachkräfte. Einmal zusammengebrochen, bleibt vieles liegen. Die Probleme des wirtschaftlichen Aufbaus sind immens. Außer Urwald und Sumpf hat Guinea-Bissau wenig zu bieten, keine interessanten Bodenschätze. Ein kleines, armes Land mit einer überwiegenden bäuerlichen Bevölkerung. Vorrangig im Parteiprogramm ist die Ertragssteigerung der Landwirtschaft. Bis 1977 soll kein Reis mehr importiert werden. Das Ziel ist realistisch. Kollektivierung und Bildung von Kooperativen werden von der Partei behutsam behandelt. Alte Dorf- und Stammesstrukturen werden nicht gewaltsam geändert. Durch Erziehung und Aufklärung soll das Volk überzeugt, nicht verscheucht werden. Ein solcher Weg ist langwierig. Guinea-Bissau ist arm, aber hier herrscht nicht das Elend und die Misere Asiens. 500 Jahre Kolonialherrschaft hatte dem Land nicht einmal eine Infrastruktur gebracht, denn es hatte außer Erdnüssen den kolonialen Märkten nicht zu bieten. Die kleinen Fische in den überschwemmten Reisfeldern sollten für die lokalen Kochtöpfe genügen. Die großen kamen aus Portugal. Das Küstenland Guinea-Bissau als Absatzmarkt für die Produkte des kolonialen Mutterlandes. Die Bemühungen der Partei, die Lebensbedingungen der Bevölkerung im Sinne einer progressiven wirtschaftlichen und sozialen Politik zu verbessern, werden von vielen Ländern unterstützt. Ausländische Finanzhilfe bewegt sich, wenn auch langsam, im Bereich einiger Millionen Dollar. Im Hafen von Bissau haben die Russen eine Tiefseefischflotte von zehn Booten aufgebaut. Aber es ist nicht nur der Ostblock, vorrangig Rumänien und die DDR, die Hilfe geben. Unterstützung für das Land kommt neben Algerien, Kuba und China auch von Schweden, Norwegen, Frankreich, Holland, der Bundesrepublik und selbst von Portugal. Auf diesem Sektor kennt die Partei keinen exklusiven Partner. Die Einheitsbewegung weiß nur zu gut, dass der wirtschaftliche Aufbau des Landes nur zögernd zu schaffen ist. Es bedarf ausländischer Investitionen und eigener harter Arbeit. Das Programm für ein Guinea nach dem Abzug der portugiesischen Kolonialherrschaft stammt von Amilcar Cabral. Der Nationalheld war sich bewusst, dass Guinea zu Not aus eigenen Kräften den Weg aus der Unterentwicklung finden muss. Das chinesische Beispiel lag nicht fern. Was Amilcar Cabral für sein Volk bedeutet haben muss, kann der Außenstehende nur ahnen. Die Verehrung für den heimgekehrten toten Helden hat aber einen über das kleine Land hinausreichenden Grund. Für die Geschichte steht seine Bedeutung fest. Der zehnjährige Befreiungskampf dieses für Portugal wirtschaftlich völlig bedeutungslosen Landes hatte entscheidend zur Entkolonialisierung Angolas und Mosambiks beigetragen. Die Konfrontation mit einer starken ideologischen und militärischen Bewegung hatte nicht zuletzt die revolutionäre Bewegung der portugiesischen Streitkräfte gefördert. Viele von den jungen portugiesischen Offizieren wie Fabiao und Otello de Cavallo dienten in Bissau. Als die Lafette langsam durch die Stadt zieht, nimmt das Volk den endgültigen Abschied von dem Mann, der das Ende der portugiesischen Kolonialherrschaft herbeigeführt hat. Es war auch das Ende der geschichtlichen Epoche der Kolonialzeit überhaupt.
So since Guinea-Bissau had nothing to offer colonial markets except for peanuts, there was no need for the Portuguese to build an infrastructure in the country in their 500 years of colonial rule. The government, of course, wanted to make the country self-sufficient uh, through cooperatives and bottom-up structures. Unfortunately, I don't think that the, comp uh, the country succeeded in doing so. Uh, this was a time in the 1970s that Navina uh, was also very interested in the topic of decolonization and as we saw in 72 she made uh, So Long As There Are Tears, uh, this film was in 76 and there's one more in 76 itself, Hotspot West, uh, Western Sahara, which we will watch now. So nahmen sie den endgültigen Abschied von ihrer ehemaligen Kolonie mit einem patriotischen Lied auf den Lippen. Die spanische Legion räumte ihre letzte Bastion in der Westsahara, Villa Cisneros. Nach fast 50 Jahren Besetzung ist Spaniens militärische Präsenz in dem Wüstenstreifen an der Atlantikküste zu Ende gegangen. Die abrückende Armee wurde jedoch lückenlos von zwei anderen ersetzt, der marokkanischen und der marotanischen. General Salazar hatte die spanische Legion seit zwölf Jahren kommandiert. Seine Mission, meinte er, sei nun erfüllt. Er füge sich gern der Anweisung aus Madrid, anderen die Verantwortung für die Westsahara zu überlassen. Allerdings, wenn die Legion einmal zu Hause ist, wird der General als Gouverneur zurückkehren, um eine Rumpfverwaltung bis zum offiziellen Ende der spanischen Herrschaft aufrecht zu erhalten. Es wird aber nur eine nominelle Präsenz sein. Von den 25.000 spanischen Zivilisten, die einst hier lebten, sind nicht mehr als 200 geblieben. Und die Macht gehört schon längst den Marokkanern. Das Dröhnen der spanischen Kampfflugzeuge, die ihre Ehrenrunden für General Salazar drehten, ersetzte die Musik einer fehlenden Kapelle. Man nahm Abschied ohne Fahnen, ohne Parade. Eine Kolonie wurde aufgegeben und wie immer war es ein Abgang ohne Ehre. Ausgehandelt, eine Einigung zwischen Marokko und Mauritanien, die Algerien nicht akzeptiert. Missachtet, den Selbstbestimmungswunsch der Sahara-Einwohner und immer lauter den Lärm eines nahenden Krieges. Ein neuer Krisenherd ist entstanden. In El Ayun wehen die Fahnen Mauritaniens, Marokkos und Spaniens offiziell nebeneinander als Symbol für die vereinbarte Dreierverwaltung. Tatsächlich haben jedoch nur die Marokkaner das Sagen hier. Die Saharwis lernen mit den neuen Herren, die sich ihre Brüder nennen, umzugehen. Allerdings sichern Militärs diesen Integrationsprozess. Kontrollen sind scharf, die Zahl der Soldaten steigt und nachts gibt es gelegentliche Razzien. Derweil geht die Marokkanisierung der Stadt weiter. Spaniens Peseten sind zwar noch im Umlauf, aber der Diram ist gefragter. Neben der neu eröffneten Bank gibt es auch eine marokkanische Post. Militärpolizei bewacht den Sitz der marokkanischen Zivilverwaltung, die sich hinter den festungsähnlichen Mauern des einzigen Hotels vor Ort verschanzt hat. Ein Beamtenapparat versucht sich hier aufzubauen und mit Hilfe der Armee für Ruhe in den Städten zu sorgen. Denn die Wiederherstellung selbst einer Scheinnormalität wird dringlicher angesichts der Pulverfasssituation an der Grenze zu Algerien. In diesem explosiven Spiel um die Sahara und ihre Einwohner hat Marokko eine Trumpfkarte. Den Präsidenten der Jema, der Generalversammlung der Saharwis, Katri Old Jamani. Noch im letzten Oktober hatte er erklärt, Marokko sei der einzige Feind der Westsahara, den es zu bekämpfen gilt. Jetzt, drei Monate später und nach einem längeren Aufenthalt in Rabat, nimmt Katri eine völlig andere Position ein. Bei jeder Kundgebung wiederholt er, Marokko sei nun der einzige Freund und gelobt sei der Tag, an dem die Sahara mit dem marokkanischen Mutterland vereinigt wurde. 
Diese Kehrtwendung im politischen Denken haben auch die meisten anderen konservativen Scheichs gemacht und sich in ihrer Mehrheit auf die Seite Marokkos geschlagen. Da ihr Einfluss in dem Stamm, dem sie jeweils vorstehen, noch groß ist, werden ihre Stammesmitglieder wohl mehr oder minder freiwillig mitziehen. Es gibt keine zuverlässige Zahl über die Stärke der marokkanischen Streitkräfte in der Sahara. Die Schätzung schwankt von 10.000 bis 12.000 Mann. Der Kommandeur der militärischen Operation im Süden ist Colonel Zmili. Bei einer Zwischenlandung in El Ayun sagte er noch vor kurzem, die militärische Situation in der Sahara sei unter Kontrolle. Zwar gäbe es weiterhin einige Zwischenfälle, aber dies sei normal, vor allem im Hinblick auf die Aktionen, die der Nachbar im Osten, gemeint war Algerien, unternimmt, um den Frieden in der Region zu stören. Aber er glaube, dass sich die Lage schnell normalisieren werde. Auf die Frage, ob es eine friedliche Lösung zwischen den beteiligten Ländern des Maghrebs geben könne, meinte Zmili, mit politischen Fragen habe er nichts zu tun. Und auf dem militärischen Gebiet? Da, meinte Zmili, gebe es keine Probleme. Er sei auch ziemlich sicher, dass kein vernünftiger Mensch einen Krieg in der Sahara anzetten werde. Die verantwortlichen Politiker und Diplomaten würden schon eine Lösung finden, die einen Krieg ausschließt, der katastrophal für alle Beteiligten sein werde. Der katastrophale Krieg schien dann in dieser Woche doch noch begonnen zu haben. 80 Kilometer von dieser Garnison entfernt liegt einer der drei bekannten Polisario-Stützpunkte, am Gala. Es war das erklärte Ziel der marokkanischen Armee, diese Hochburgen der Rebellen, wie die Polisarios genannt werden, irgendwann einmal zu umzingeln und anzugreifen. Aber vorerst galt es, sich in den wichtigen Städten zu etablieren und das Vertrauen der Sahrawis zu gewinnen. Die Armee suchte den Kontakt zu den überraschten Nomaden. Ein Armeelehrer unterrichtete in der Schule. Ein Militärarzt nahm sich der Kranken an. Die heilige und strategisch wichtige Stadt Smara füllte sich wieder. Von den geflüchteten 7000 Saharuis kamen 6000 wieder zurück. Das Leben normalisierte sich nach dem Abzug der Spanier und dem Einzug der Marokkaner. Freute man sich oder tat man nur so? Ein marokkanischer Soldat antwortete, ob die uns mögen, weiß ich nicht. Sie müssen uns einfach mögen, denn wir sind jetzt da. Die Saharwis und ihre Kinder sind zu den Lebensquellen der Wüste zurückgekehrt, zu den Wasserstellen. Ob es schwere Repressalien seitens der marokkanischen Armee gegen die Zivilbevölkerung gegeben hat, konnten wir nicht feststellen. Genauso schwierig ist es, ein Urteil zu fällen, bei wem dieses an Entbehrungen gewöhnte Nomadenvolk politisch am besten aufgehoben wäre. Für Selbstbestimmung ist es zu so schwach und zu so unorganisiert um sich gegen die neuen Machthaber Marokko und Mauritanien zu behaupten. Selbst wenn kaum 80 Kilometer von hier die Polisario zusammen mit Algerien für ihre Unabhängigkeit kämpft. Die marokkanische Armee verteidigt, wie sie sagt, ihr rechtmäßiges Territorium. Denn die letzte Runde, in der die Spanier auf ihre Sahara-Sandtorte zugunsten Marokkos und Mauritaniens verzichteten, wurde nicht in der Wüste, sondern auf den grünen Verhandlungstisch ausgetragen. Die militärische Besetzung kam später. Marokko begründet den Anspruch auf die Westsahara mit historischen, kulturellen und geografischen Bindungen. Denn das Großkönigreich erstreckte sich einst vom Mittelmeer bis Mauritanien. Heute besinnt man sich dieser Bindungen umso mehr, denn in der Zwischenzeit wurde Phosphat in der Wüste entdeckt, in den ertragreichen Minen von Bukra. Rund um die Uhr werden die Anlagen streng bewacht. Der Betrieb steht seit Mitte Dezember letzten Jahres still 
und niemand vermag zu sagen, wann er wieder aufgenommen wird. Hier findet man den Kern des Konfliktes. Mit Bukra nimmt Marokko eine Monopolstellung im Phosphatmarkt ein und kann, selbst wenn Spanien weiterhin mit 35 Prozent beteiligt ist, eventuell die Preise auf dem Weltmarkt diktieren. 96 Kilometer lang erstreckt sich das Förderband wie eine Narbe durch die Wüste zum Verladehafen in der Nähe von El Ayun. Ein ideales Ziel für Sabotagetrupps der Polisario. Die aktive Unterstützung der Freiheitskämpfe durch Algerien ist auch nicht nur von edlen Motiven getragen. Dass auch eine Portion Selbstinteresse mit im Spiel ist, wird klar, wenn man weiß, dass sich Algerien für seinen Eisenerzexport den direkten Zugang zum Atlantik sichern möchte. Algerien fürchtet politische Schikanen, wenn die Westsahara bei Marokko bleibt. So the Spanish left taking every last thing with them. Um, Morocco and Mauritanian um, negotiated an agreement with them and stepped in. Um, Algeria is also helping the Prolisario, but again, there are economic motives to their so-called helping uh, Western Sahara. Uh, this is basically what we see in all the three firms, uh, the situation of the country once the colonial rulers leave. Um, if we now go to the commentary by uh, Navina, which can also be found on the same page below, which the world was divided uh, up among the broadcasters, one, uh, this was shot in 2018, and here one also sees how the broadcasters divide up the world just like the colonial rulers. <laughs> Also hauptsächlich war ich für den Weltspiegel unterwegs, ähm, äh, was auch ein bisschen ungewöhnlich war, weil wir von der Redaktion aus selten Leute hingeschickt hatten. Wir hatten ja oder haben immer noch bei der ARD äh, diese und ZDF, das Korrespondentennetzwerk. Äh, und die Welt wurde ja aufgeteilt in den unter den verschiedenen Sendern. Ähm, <lacht> Spanisch Sahara, also da es in Spanien gehörte ursprünglich, das war dann ein hessischer Rundfunk. Und äh, ich glaube Rabat, wegen Marokko, gehörte auch hessischer Rundfunk. Ich, ich bin mir nicht ganz sicher, auf jeden Fall war ich, ähm, da der Korrespondent selber zu dem Zeitpunkt nicht konnte, oder okay. dann konnte man in diese Lücke sozusagen einspringen und... Äh, äh, Wolltest du da gerne hin? Hast du Mitspracherecht gehabt oder kriegst du da den Anruf? Nein, 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 das wollte ich schon, schon hin. Das war ein faszinierendes Thema auch, ähm, wenn eine Kolonie aufgegeben wurde und endet. Kolonialismus ist etwas, was mein, mein ganzes Berichtsleben auch äh, interessiert hat. Und hier sah man, also zumindest äh, konnte man sehen, diesen historischen Moment, wo die tatsächlich äh, äh, abziehen mit Mann und Maus und die haben wirklich, äh, die Spanier haben den letzten Wasserhahn mitgenommen. Also das war so auch typisch, ne? so nicht verbrannter Erde, war da, aber öde Wüste in diesem Falle würde man, würde man sagen. So basically um, we've come to the end of the first part. Um, which is the actual act of the colonial rulers leaving um, their colonies. Um, uh, the second part is uh, decolonizing the mind, which I think also uh, Navina was very keen on also with using this archive and uh, uh, getting people to talk about it and take a stand. So um, before we show the first film, it is basically um, the author Pavan K. Verma in Becoming Indian, he says, the end of colonization does not signal the end of its consequences because colonialism was not just about the physical oppression of people, its real strength lay in the colonization of minds. So we now see the epilogue to the film Drum. Uh, the film was shown uh, within a film club a program um, and uh, Uh, Navina was invited to uh, give a comment after the uh, screening of the film. So this is her commentary on the film, on television. 
1980. Und so trommelt die indische Armee noch heute beim Zapfenstreich am Tage der Republik. Alles noch nach guter britischer Tradition. Die Melodien haben sich zwar geändert, auch der abendliche Trinkspruch in den Offizierscasinos Gentleman the President heißt es heute, nicht mehr Gentleman the King. Aber sonst? Und dennoch sind die Parallelen oberflächlich. Ich selber steckte in den Kinderschuhen, als die Engländer aus Indien abzogen. Aber der Bruch mit dem Kolonialismus, vor allem mit dem geistigen Kolonialismus, vollzog sich nicht so schnell. Es hat viele, viele Jahre gedauert, ehe sich der feine Inder von dieser fremden Kultur befreite bzw. sie den indischen Verhältnissen anpasste und die so veränderte Form verinnerlichte. Selbst heute bleibt eine kleine, aber einflussreiche Schicht anglophil. Meine eigene Erziehung erfolgte auch ganz im kolonialen Stil, mit dem einen Unterschied, dass jetzt die braunen Saabs die Rolle der Weißen übernahmen. Aber an der Grundeinstellung hatte sich damals wenig geändert. Sie brachten mir englische Geschichte und englische Literatur in der Schule bei, in der Lawrence School of Sana. Von derselben Schule hatte Rudyard Kipling einmal gesagt, noch zu seiner Zeit, send him to Sana and make a man of him. Nun ist kein Mann aus mir geworden, denn zu meiner Zeit wurde Sana ein Internat für die Töchter und Söhne der indischen Oberschicht. Heute, Gott sei Dank, lehrt man dort endlich indische Geschichte und indische Literatur. Aus der sicheren Distanz der späteren Generation, bewaffnet mit den Gedanken und Ideen von Franz Fanon und neben ganzen Arsenal der antikolonialen Geschichte, habe ich mit Vergnügen und mit gelassenem Interesse diesem brillanten Werk Gefahr am Doropass zugeschaut. Gekonnt gemacht, humorvoll dargestellt, einfach gutes Kino, aber voller perfide Klischees. Prinz Gul, der seinen Bruder ermordet und die Engländer verjagen will, ist natürlich ein Wahnsinniger, dem Visionen eines Großreiches der Moguls vorschwebt. Er stirbt einen verdienten, gewaltsamen Tod. Selbstverständlich kommt Prinz Asim, der am liebsten die britische Uniform des Trommlerjungens anziehen möchte, an die Macht. Der Prinz wird natürlich den Schutzvertrag mit den Engländern unterzeichnen. Er bekommt die Herrschaft über sein Volk und die Engländer behalten, auf nette Weise, die Herrschaft über ihn. Es ist alles so einleuchtend, so klar. Man freut sich richtig, wenn es endlich so weit ist. Der Aufstand gegen die Engländer ist also nur die Fehlgeburt eines krankhaften Gehirns. Der Freiheitsdrang der Batanen nur der Ehrgeiz eines intrigierenden Lokalpotentaten. Aber was könnte man ja gegen die Engländer haben? Ein so zivilisiertes Volk, das schottische Lieder in der wilden Nordwestprovinz singt, da, wo Mrs. Carruthers als einzige weiße Frau sich hinwagt, um ein bisschen von der Anmut und Süße des Lebens, das man im fernen England zurückgelassen hat, in die Wildnis zu bringen. Interessant in diesem Zusammenhang ist die Bemerkung von Marjorie. Ich hasse Indien, sagt sie. Daraufhin die Antwort ihres Verlobten, aber du kennst Indien nicht. Marjorie will es aber auch nicht kennenlernen. Sie folgt ihrem Mann in die Berge aus Liebe und Pflichtbewusstsein. Das ist die Filmversion. In Wirklichkeit jedoch fingen die Probleme der Kolonialherren an, als sie ihre Ehefrauen nachholten. Sie wollten in Indien ein Klein-England schaffen, mit Gardinen, Yorkshire Pudding und mit einem englischen Kamin mitten im indischen Schnee. Als der Film in Bombay zum ersten Mal 1938 gezeigt wurde, kam es zu Unruhen. Die indischen Nationalisten stellten Streikposten vor dem Kino auf. Sie nahmen Anstoß an dem jungen Schauspieler Sabu, der ihrer Meinung nach gegen die Inder ausgespielt wurde. Die britischen Machthaber hatten daraufhin weitere Aufführungen dieses Filmes in Indien verboten. Es wäre unfair, den Film Gefahr am Doro Pass an den Maßstäben unserer Zeit zu messen. Er hatte einen anderen Auftrag zu erfüllen und den hat er glänzend geleistet. Ich muss gestehen, ich fand ihn gut und hatte viel Spaß dabei, ihm zuzuschauen. Der Hintergrund tangierte mich rein akademisch. 
Es bleibt zu hoffen, dass Gefahr am Doro Pass eben in diesem Zusammenhang 40 Jahre danach auch so verstanden wird und nicht nur als Bestätigung von latenten und oft leider ausgesprochenen Vorurteilen den Völkern der dritten Welt gegenüber. So, as Navina said, the film was made at a certain time for a certain purpose and sure, it serves to reproduce prejudices against Indian, Indians or people in the global south. But if you uh, think back also to the introduction of the film, um, she also points to what is forever imprinted uh, on the minds of the colonized. We now move to um, an interview with Edward Braithwaite in 1976. So let's take a look. Die Zukunft Südafrikas wird uns in den nächsten Jahren sehr beschäftigen. Gibt es eine Chance, die Südafrikaner von ihrer Politik abzubringen, die direkt auf einen Rassenkrieg zusteuert? You must be joking. Wir spaßen wohl. Der Südafrikaner ist ein Tier, das sich nicht ändern kann, weil es von der Richtigkeit seines Standpunktes überzeugt ist. Und viele Industrienationen unterstützen ihn sogar darin. Welche Staaten? Germany supports the South African position. Deutschland, Frankreich, England, die Vereinigten Staaten und Japan. Die Einstellung Südafrikas zu Rhodesien ist das Interessanteste an diesem ganzen Spiel. Die Rhodesier müssen Zugeständnisse an die Schwarzen machen, meinen die Südafrikaner. Aber wenn man den Spieß umdreht und sagt, Arzt, heile dich selbst. Ihr seht ein, dass Zugeständnisse für Rhodesien wichtig sind, warum denn eigentlich nicht für euch selber? Dann aber machen die Südafrikaner auf die Eigenarten ihres Landes aufmerksam. Wir beteiligen keine Schwarzen an der Regierung, sagen sie, weil sie bald eine eigene Bantu-Regierung haben werden in den Homelands. Wenn man Südafrika nicht kennt, klingt das sehr überzeugend. Ich war aber in Südafrika und habe diese Homelands besucht. Ich weiß, dass der schwarze Mann dort niemals eine eigene, unabhängige Regierung bilden kann. Erstens liegen die Homelands in den unfruchtbarsten Gegenden von Südafrika. Kein weißer Südafrikaner würde den Schwarzen Gebiete überlassen, wo es die Möglichkeit gibt, eine selbstständige wirtschaftliche Entwicklung zu betreiben. Ist das denn ein so dürres Gebiet? Absolut ja. Für mich war es interessant, in die Transkei zu fahren. Die Transkei soll im Oktober unabhängig werden. Ja. Nach der offiziellen Regierungspolitik sollen die Geschäfte, die jetzt im Besitz der Weißen sind, an die Schwarzen übergeben werden, die allmählich auf diese Übernahme vorbereitet werden sollen. Ich fragte einen weißen Ladenbesitzer, sagen Sie mal, der Schwarze dort, der für Sie arbeitet, bilden Sie ihn eigentlich für die Zeit der Geschäftsübernahme aus? Da lachte er und meinte, vielleicht wenn mein Enkel erwachsen ist. Der Mann war 35 Jahre alt. Für die Dauer Ihres offiziellen Besuches in Südafrika hat die Regierung Ihnen den Titel eines Ehrenweisen verliehen. Sie könnten sich überall frei bewegen. Sie haben auch mit Weißen gesprochen, die sich sehr abfällig zu Ihnen, einem Schwarzen, über die Schwarzen Südafrikas geäußert haben. Wie war es Ihnen zumute? Es war schon ein merkwürdiges Gefühl. Meine Hautfarbe ist offensichtlich schwarz. Nun, wenn mich einer anguckt und in mir einen Weißen sieht, da werde ich böse. Ich will kein Weißer sein. Ich bin, wer ich bin. Die Weißen in Südafrika haben meinen Einwand immer überhört. Und das hat mich fasziniert. Sie sind so einfältig, wenn es um ihre Interessen geht. Oft wurde ich sogar unhöflich. Schauen Sie, habe ich gesagt, ich bin unheimlich glücklich in meiner schwarzen Haut. Ich möchte um keinen Preis mit euch tauschen, denn ihr habt mir nichts zu bieten. I wouldn't change it for anything. And I wouldn't want to be white because you've got nothing to offer me for which I would exchange this. 
And they would behave as if you hadn't spoken at all. Sie haben eine tiefgehende Angst in der südafrikanischen Gesellschaft gemerkt, nicht nur bei den Schwarzen, sondern auch bei den Weißen. Südafrika ist eben ein Polizeistaat. Aber ist nicht gerade dieser Angst so etwas wie ein Nährboden für eine Opposition, die eventuell zu einer Explosion oder sagen wir lieber zu einer Implosion führen könnte? So etwas ist schon möglich. Aber in diesem Falle sind es die Weißen, die unzufrieden sind. Sie spüren nämlich den Druck ihrer eigenen Regierung. Diese Gesellschaft besteht aus Spionen. Die südafrikanische Sicherheitspolizei bezahlt jedermann, damit er gegen jedermann aussagt. Kinder verraten Erwachsene. Children are informers on the grown-ups. Man hat Angst davor. Keiner macht eine Bemerkung, von der er glaubt, sie könnte zu seinem Nachteil ausgelegt werden. Sie schweigen lieber. Aber letzten Endes glaube ich, dass diese Unzufriedenheit der Weißen in Südafrika verschwinden wird und sie sich zusammenschließen werden gegen die sogenannte schwarze Gefahr. Es wird niemals eine gemeinsame Front der Weißen und der Schwarzen gegen den Staat geben. Wie steht es mit dem politischen Bewusstsein der Schwarzen? Sie sind hochpolitisch. Aus bitterer Erfahrung haben sie gelernt, sich zu tarnen. Wenn man ihnen zum ersten Mal begegnet, dann reden sie über Fußball, über das Wetter oder Cricket, über alles, nur nicht über Politik. Aber wenn man ihr Vertrauen gewonnen hat, dann sprechen sie mit großer Sachkenntnis über die politische Situation. Man wundert sich, woher sie in dieser zensierten Gesellschaft ihre Informationen bekommen. Ich glaube, dass es eine sehr aktive Untergrundbewegung in Südafrika gibt. Die weiße afrikanische Bevölkerung ist doch so etwas wie ein verlorener weißer Stamm Afrika. Sie hat keine europäische Heimat mehr, zu der sie zurückkehren könnte und hat ein bestimmtes Recht, in Südafrika zu bleiben. Wer sagt, dass sie da bleiben müssen? Wo sollen sie hin? Wo sind die Pierre-Noir von Algerien hingegangen? Aber sie hatten eine Heimat, Frankreich. Viele von den Algerien-Franzosen waren genauso entwurzelt wie die weißen Afrikaner in Südafrika. Aber wenn die Weißen meinen, sie haben nirgends einen anderen Platz, wohin sie gehen können, dann müssen sie auch begreifen, dass die Zeiten sich geändert haben. Sie müssen mit den anderen Menschen in Südafrika zusammenleben. Sie können nicht einfach beschließen, wir sind Weiße und deshalb ergreifen wir Besitz von diesem Territorium. Und die anderen können sich zum Teufel scheren. Okay, aber das setzt eine grundlegende Veränderung Ihrer Denkweise voraus. Wer soll das herbeiführen? Die Weißen oder eine organisierte schwarze Bewegung, die Druck ausübt? Wissen Sie, diese Fragen sind gar nicht mal so undenkbar. Wenn Sie sich die Geschichte Afrikas ansehen, dann waren die weißen Afrikaner nicht die einzige europäische Gruppe, die sich dort niedergelassen und ein eigenes Leben aufgebaut haben. Das gleiche geschah in Kenia und in Sambia. Auch die Franzosen hatten Guinea voll unter ihrer Kontrolle. Das hat sich aber alles geändert. Wenn Menschen glauben, dass sie rechtmäßig irgendwo hingehören, dann können sie auch zu der Erkenntnis gelangen, dass andere genau das gleiche Recht haben, in diesem Land in Würde zu leben. Man kann sich einigen. Die Gefahr kommt nur, wenn die eine Gruppe sagt, ich habe das Recht hier zu bleiben, du aber nicht. Also für 
And I think also what uh, it makes very clear is uh, that uh, decolonization of the mind is not just for uh, those who are colonized, but also for the colonial rulers, that there needs to be a decolonization that takes place in their minds so uh, that everyone lives with dignity, as he said, and um, uh, in equality. And this is, uh, you know, this is not always um, the case. And this is also something that one needs to work on. And if this were like um, a training session or a workshop with students, I would um, also bring up and say, how does one recognize this internalized dominance or the internalized oppression, uh, which has you know, been written on our bodies since, um, since um, decades and centuries? Um, and I mean, uh, the, the dominance with subtle racism, where, for example, here you see justifications of white South Africans um, that they use uh, not to include back black people, for example, in the, uh, in the government, offering them the ho homelands, which are not uh, economically lucrative at all. So uh, what do we need to decolonize the mind on both sides? And um, before I end now with a commentary of Navina's, uh, I would just like to um, uh, read out a quote by Paulo Freire in 1970. The oppressed, having internalized the image of the oppressor and adopted his guidelines, are fearful of freedom. Freedom would require them to eject this image and replace it with autonomy and responsibility. And I think that uh, Navina's commentary now, the last one, I took a stand, also portrays this quite well. Ich habe eine Meinung gehabt und ich <laughs> die habe ich immer noch. Ich war sehr engagiert und ich habe keinen Hehl daraus gemacht. Ich habe mich auch immer dagegen verwahrt, zu sagen, äh, ne, die eine Seite, andere Seite. Ich sage, ich mache einen Film, weil ich den, ich habe einen Standpunkt. Sonst soll jemand anders den Film machen. Und äh, das ist dann ähm, etwas, was für mich sehr wichtig war. Ich will wissen, wenn ich einen Film sehe, wo steht der Mensch? Ne? Na gut, das war unsere ganze Generation auch von, von Journalisten, die so vorgegangen sind in den, ne? mit einem dezidierten, man hatte auch einen dezidierten rechten Standpunkt. Also ich weiß nicht, ob du dich an einen Gerhard Löwenthal erinnern kannst. Und dann hatten wir jemanden wie Peter Merseburger auf der anderen Seite. Das ist ein bisschen vorher gewesen als diese Debatte, aber das, das waren die beiden ähm, lagern oder ja. sagen wir mal, äh, ein politischer Standpunkt, was, äh, was äh, wichtig war. Dann später hieß es, äh, wir waren zu politisch. Neutralität muss gewahrt werden. Es muss entideologisieren, haben die das genannt. Was absolut Quatsch ist, weil auch die Entideologisieren ist, ist auch eine Ideologie. Ja. Ist wirklich. Und in, was du dann, dann äh, verbreitest mit einer eine reinen Wiedergabe von dem, was du siehst, das ist Quatsch. Du, es, also es ist ein, eine sehr verlogene Debatte. Und dann finde ich es einfach besser, wenn man ähm, diesen Haltung Stand, zeigt, ja. die Haltung zeigt. Und dafür kriegt man dann Schläge oder auch nicht. Und dann muss man dann dazu stehen. Ne? Thanks a lot, Rebecca. And with this comment, I think we appropriately close the first part of today's program. And uh, would also, um, there is a tea break now um, scheduled for half an hour. And of course, you're very welcome to address both myself and Rebecca if you have any questions. Thank you to both of you. I think it's a phenomenal effort that you've done, uh, the way you've organized it, and uh, it really sets you thinking. I mean, the archive has such amazing information, the kind of perspectives that you have. It covers a period in time to that level of detail. And as you said, there are 
spots or dark spots, uh, which are, that it isn't comprehensive in some which way, but it's phenomenal. And I think the other thing that it really gets across is uh, the lady herself, she's amazing. I think just the, the idea that a greater audience can get to know of her, can learn from her, and the honesty, the brutal honesty with which she puts the fact. My uh, only question was, you know, you read this very poignant uh, uh, letter that she wrote to her brother saying, look, you're the adventurous one, you're going back, this is my stand, and that was a perspective in the 70s. Is there another letter which is more recent that we could get a perspective of how her evolution and how she uh, saw life much later? Do we have that in the archive as well? Not as a letter. The letters end actually with this one in 1971. The ones which we have, I think Gita might uh, have more letters or even uh, Navina's widower, uh, which we could add to the archive later. But as far as I knew, uh, it was very difficult for her. The whole question of going back uh, was uh, actually troubling her all her life through. In the end, she didn't go back in 1971. She remained in Germany and be she became this important figure in, in German TV. And um, I, I mean, she herself couldn't really explain why she didn't take this last decision to go back. But I think she had the feeling and this is really true, that she could also move things there. I mean, that's a, it's a very difficult question. Do I go back and do I, things, uh, do I, do I want to change things and myself, uh, bringing myself to India? She actually had bought an editing table, as far as I know, and equipment to bring it all here to start an independent documentary film project. Um, and join her brother in his actions here. But then, uh, in a way, she, yeah, I mean, I, I've, I asked her a couple of times. And I think sometimes she regretted that she didn't. And at, at times, and especially in the last time when we had published this, and she received the tremendous feedback to this archive in Germany, um, she felt like, OK, she made peace somehow with her decision. I mean, yeah, that's at least my. Yeah. Rubina, there's stuff and there's your, uh, you know, videos. Do you have a perspective on that, or of what she thought? Um, on the one hand, I would say this is a this is a classical dilemma for anyone who's a migrant. I mean, I've lived for the past uh, almost 20 years in Germany, and I'm here right now. Uh, well, I'm between both countries, and I face the same thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but um, for Navina, ha having established that much in Germany and you know being the face of television, it was a whole another dimension because she had created and built so much there. So, but I think that all uh, those uh, who were living there for a certain you always have this thing: I want to go back. And when you're here, I only think about I want to go back again. So you're always caught between these two worlds. And uh, so I prefer to say that I'm a citizen of the world than of Germany or India. I think Navina would have put it the same way. Yeah. 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 Between tree and bark. <laughs> If there are no direct questions now, but there will be later also time to speak together, but um, maybe we shall have a break. And um, as I said, you can always come to us any time today. We're here. It's, it's the launch of the project, and there will be many more occasions also to, I mean, just get in touch with us any time. Um, or, or SSAF and Good Institute have our address, and um, we are very... We're very glad, actually, that <laughs> Vivan and Gita have addressed so strongly that we should bring the archive to India. But uh, what will happen here with it? That's up to you. I mean, that's uh, not our. Um, that's not our. Um, we we can't. We can just hand it over. So, well, but we shall discuss this later with Madhu and Vincent. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Um, just to say, I for one will definitely use the archive. Um, I've worked as a trainer and I've always used film excerpts at the end to sum up my training sessions. Um, and I think uh, that this kind of, it was, it was really great to do this exercise because you can build an entire training. Of course, this was just like snapshots 
uh, and, but if you would do a normal training, you would do it for a day and a half and go in depth and get participants to talk about it. And I think whether it's gender, which we'll be doing at the JNU on Monday, or um, racism or migration, there is tremendous potential in this archive. So, Actually, I did a whole seminar uh, at, um, at the Mainz University, um, which started from this archive, and then we went all the way through diversity in German media, when did it start, which were the first radio programs for foreigners, how is it today, um, there is an association called New German uh, Media um, People, which, are, uh, which was uh, founded by only people with a migrant backward, and now there are 2,000 members. So we went all the way till today with the students, and it was a very... It was very intense, and in the end, we ended up in the in the in the university now because uh, Vincent Mais. No, I mean, there's so many discussion right now about um, decolonization of the of the universities themselves, and um, so we ended up there, and we opened the seminar to have a space to discuss this. So yeah, it gives a lot of uh, opportunities, I guess. There is no direct question now. Shall we take a break? Yes. Thank you. Thanks a lot. We'll now um, screen the documentary Freedom and its Price, uh, originally called Die Freiheit und ihr Preis, um, filmed by Navina Sundaram in 1973, shortly after Bangladesh gained independence. I if I tell something wrong, please correct me. I know there are eyewitnesses in the room. <laughs> it's a film shot on location, and this was very important for Navina, with a complete, um, completely uh, a South Asian team. She didn't want to go there with a German man on the camera and on the sound, so she asked her dear friends from the studio in New Delhi, Suresh Patel and Arun Puranik, operating the camera, and H. Bhattacharya recording the sound. So uh, she always said to me, that was very important for us to come there as South Asians to South Asia. And um, it was very unusual at the time that a female young journalist was allowed to direct a feature. This was in 1973, so um, she was really young at the time. And Navina had to fight until post-production, for example, and this is also always a, a story we like to tell, uh, to speak the commentary herself, not because she was a migrant, but because she was a woman. And at the time, it was very rare that a woman would narrate a political film because the common opinion in Germany was that the audience would not take it seriously if a woman is talking. I mean, let's just not forget this is not so long ago. <laughs> so I'm very happy to show this film here. Um, I think it's extraordinarily done also in the cinematic way. It's, um, she followed the, the, the idea of direct cinema with this film and um, I'm, I'm very happy that we can screen it here today. And um, we'll have a discussion later on archiving in general, but keep the film in mind and we, we, we will also have the time to speak about what can be done with this film here today and what, what, what meaning it has today. So, um, yeah. Now, The Freedom and Its Price, it's 43 minutes. Madhu and Vincent, please join me in the front. Welcome. Uh, come this way. Each have a mic. Yeah. Please um, feel free to join us in this round of discussion. I will do a short introduction. So why the three of us are sitting here actually, also to give you a chance to get to know what they are doing in the in the course of archival practice, which is our. Um, which is our theme now, but uh, please feel free to join in whenever you want. Um, I need uh, the projector still on because I would like to show the websites. As you can, 
I had mentioned, uh, thank you. I had mentioned that the archive, the fifth wall, has been developed within a very productive network called Archive Außer Sich. It's hard to translate. It actually means ar archives off the leash or archives going wild. Okay. Um, and um, this is a very transnational network with projects um, from Germany, Lebanon, Sudan, Egypt, India, Nigeria, and many other places in the world. The common ground is, to keep it yet very short now, um, that all of us were convinced that local independent film archives are vulnerable and need safe spaces to exist and to grow. And the basic problem is that the state-owned or state-protected archives almost always have to be national. Archive Außer Sich has been running from 2017 to 2021. It was a project initiated by Arsenal Institute for Cinema and Video Art and uh, with many partners around the world. And it built upon another decade of different projects circulating around um, this issue, what Madhu called archiving as actions projects, like Living Archive, Visionary Archive, and now in 2023, the second edition of the Biennial Archival Assemblies. Um, all three of us have been participating in this project in one way or another, but actually we met in 2005, which is long, long ago, um, when the idea of forming transnational networks goes actually back to this time. Um, and also we met with Navina Sundaram during this project, Import-Export, which I mentioned before. Um, it was a series of events in Mumbai, Vienna and Berlin and it consisted of 40 plus case studies, art exhibitions, documentary productions, and a book. And the Indian partner was Majlis with artistic director Madhur Sridatta and one of the case studies on the famous India films by German director Fritz Lang, The Tiger of Ashnapur and The Indian Tomb, was conducted by Vincent Sediger and Minakshi Shede. So many years have passed and I would like to introduce you now from today's point of view. Madhushri Datta next to me is a film, and most of you know her, but I'll still do it. I always wanted to do this. She's a filmmaker, a creator, and an author living in Mumbai, Berlin, and Cologne. No, Mumbai and Berlin. She prefers to call herself a cultural producer, and she has been the executive director of Majlis Cultural Center in Mumbai from 1990 to 2016, and the artistic director of the Academy of the Arts of the World in Cologne, Germany, from 2018 to 2021. She has initiated several public art and archive projects within and outside Majlis and oh, AD, ADKDW. <laughs> <laughs> and right now she's working on a new feature film and will be a fellow of Cologne Art University in 2023 and 2024. Hi, Madhu. And next to Madhu is Vincenz Hediger. He's a professor of cinema studies at the Goethe University in Frankfurt am Main, where he directs the grad graduate research training program Configurations of Film. And he's a co-speaker of Contrast, Trust and Conflict, an interdisciplinary research initiative in the Normative Orders Research Center at the Goethe University. Um, Vincent, Madhu entitled this round of discussion Archiving as Action, and you have actively contributed to this field in the project of developing the first Master of Film Archiving and Film Culture in Africa together with the Nigerian Film Corporation, NFC, and the University of Jos. And I now switch to the website of your, um, your department at Goethe University where there's um, uh, also um, in a text on this, uh, but maybe you want to give us a bit of insight yourself, how you came to this project and what actually you did. Um, yes, thank you very much. Uh, uh, but let me first start yeah. by acknowledging what an incredible feat uh, the fifth wall is and what an incredible achievement in archiving as action. Um, people here might not know this, but it starts with the achievement of prying open the black box of the German television archive, which is the most retentive institution that you can possibly imagine in the world of archiving. 
And for you to have access to these films and to be able to process them in this way, to digitize them, to put them online with an unlimited license, and to do that kind of editorial work is such an incredible achievement. And, and uh, <clears throat> an achievement that I think is also important in that it helps us thinking about archival spaces that go beyond the national heritage frameworks, that go beyond national cultural spaces, and that um, show us how we can use the affordances of the digital world to, to really develop uh, entirely new modes of archiving. This, what I also like about it is the modular structure and how it can grow and uh, how it is a potentially structurally open archive. Um, <clears throat> so I just want to say that <clears throat> decolonization, as we learned from Novino's pr um, uh <laughs> letter, starts at home. And um, uh, one, of the, one of the bastions uh, that um, uh, we need to storm and that you've already cracked, cracked open with this project is really the German television archive. They also have a lot of material on, on Africa that remains um, uh, hidden from public view. Um, and uh, hopefully we're working towards uh, a dynamics where uh, all that material becomes more easily accessible. Um, <clears throat> this particular initiative actually comes out of Archive außer sich. I always translate it as archives beyond themselves, but you know, it's, it's, really, it's really hard it's to really translate. Hard to it's translate. hard to translate. Nobody's ever satisfied with any of the translations. Um, and uh, in Archive außer sich, there was a Lagos leg, um, which came about through the intervention of the then head of the Lagos Goethe uh, Institute, Marco André Schmachtel, who um, was very much in contact with local curators, activists, uh, people who were interested in film heritage archives and put them in touch with, with the Berlin crew. And that's how the contact between Didi Chico and uh, Stephanie uh, was first established. And Didi Chico is the founder of the Lagos Film Society, a critic, curator, filmmaker, off off Nollywood filmmaker, and someone who's made it his mission to recover the pre-Nollywood celluloid heritage of Nigerian cinema. So the films that were made between 1960 and about 1991, when whatever was left of the budding celluloid-based Nigerian film industry crashed under the weight of uh, the, the World Monetary Fund's um, uh, austerity policies, which were imposed on Nigeria when the, when the oil boom came to an end. And uh, that was a moment of, of total collapse of audiovisual production, which then led to the emergence of the video industries that we now know as Nollywood. And <clears throat> so what is missing from, from public view and public memory is everything that came before almost everything that came before. And uh, Didi set out on a search for certain films that he knew existed and that were given for lost. Um, and uh, at one point, he uh, got access to the more or less closed down offices of the Nigerian Film Corporation, the state body for the encouragement of film production and film culture at Lagos, and uh, realized that they had an archive but it was in a state of total decay. He started browsing through it and found reels of one of the films that um, he was looking for, Sheikh Umar, um, a Hausa film from the mid-70s. And then he took it from there, traveled to the National Film Archive in Jos, in the center of the country, uh, which is uh, in Plateau State at an eleva elevation of 1,200 meters, mild climate, um, good place for film archiving, actually. Um, and uh, discovered the rest of the reels, and then in the context of Archive um, Aussersich, uh, Arsenal arranged for a digital restoration and an edition of that film. And in that context, Didi organized a workshop on questions of film heritage in, in JOS, and we traveled to JOS and had a discussion about very basic uh, questions of what film preservation meant, what the challenges were, what the politics of film preservation could be. 
And at the end of that conference, our colleagues in JAWS from the university and the film archive and the film institution said, you guys in Frankfurt, you have this master's program in uh, film archiving, which we had set up in 2013. It's actually going to celebrate its 10th year uh, this year. And the, the purpose of that program, it's a, it's, it's a practice-oriented master program, is to train, we use, always put it like that, it sounds a bit technocratic, but it's a pre precise mission. Uh, we train scientific personnel for archives and institutions of film culture. Uh, so not necessarily technicians for film archiving, but people who you know, think in the conceptual frameworks of archival politics uh, and are qualified enough to ask all the right questions when they open uh, uh, a film reel or discover a film reel. What are we going to do with it? Who, who does it belong to? Who are, do we have to talk to it to save the material basis? So that's the kind of training that we're offering. And, and our Nigerian colleague said, we need this. That's what we need here. And I said, well, that's uh, an interesting idea. Um, what I did see is that they had the same constellation that we have in Frankfurt, a research university and archive, um, and a state agency that was interested in organizing this project. When I got back to Frankfurt, I talked to our head of international affairs, and she said, well, the DAD has a program for that. Um, they have a program where they fund the transfer and replication of established German master's programs in different places in the world. And we submitted an application and were actually successful, uh, which is historic because this is the first ever humanities project that they funded in this program. This was obviously a program designed to uh, organize transfer into life sciences, engineering, um, uh, you know, the stuff people in the global north think people in the global south need more than the humanities. Um, and, <clears throat> and so that was a breakthrough moment. And we've been working on this for four years now. Um, we were able to add a scholarship program. Uh, we can offer scholarships to six students from Africa to study there. Uh, so that they, they get to do the, the, the full degree free of charge and we're able to offer internship uh, fellowships for uh, a select number of students in the program who then come to Germany for half a year, take courses at the university and, and work in the archives. Um, the idea basically is to build capacity that will allow Nigeria to handle its own archiving measure, uh, needs and, and uh, engage in institution building going forward. The biggest challenge right now is that pretty much everything that's being produced now is digital, digital native um, technical challenge. So we need to start thinking about digital archiving in ways that we haven't really done uh, thoroughly yet, um, which also makes this, again, a really interesting model. And then there's the continuing problem of um, a relative lack of trust in uh, government agencies um, by uh, film producers who are, as a general rule, private entrepreneurs, privately funded, now increasingly funded by, you know, international players like Netflix, but that's just the very elevated stratum of, uh, of the market. Um, and so one of the problems that we really have to bridge is that when we, with our partners, take action in Nigeria, um, we have to work very hard to gain the trust of cultural producers who will doubt the motives, certainly, of the government um, employees uh, and will be very reluctant to hand over any materials that they could lose control over. Um, even if it means that if they retain them, they will continue to, to decay. So that's uh, an overlong introduction to what we've been thinking. No, but actually it's a very good keyword to, um, because uh, the, the, the question of how uh, do, do um, 
is there a trust, is there confidence between cultural producers and, uh, and the state? And uh, in this way, you are coming from the state side with your project. And um, I would like to go now to Madhu and switch to the Majlis website, which actually also got finished very recently. Um, finally, very important. And uh, Madhu, tell us a bit about your, um, you are a cultural producer and um, Uh, you have just finished this. Um, do you want to switch to it yourself, actually? Oh, yeah, maybe. yeah, maybe it's better. Because, yeah. Do you have a mic? Yeah. Do you? I don't know how to operate it. Oh, okay. Well, um, this is a particular page. I'll come to, I explain it a little later. Uh, is uh, Sanjay Kak still here? Sanjay, especially for you. No, he has gone. To, okay. Um, we're talking about decolonizing. I mean, that's the main keyword this evening. And it's interesting that you put um, Vincent's next to me, I mean, put me next to Vincent's, <laughs> who comes from the mighty state of Germany, and little Majlis, which was uh, kind of um, street action um, um, center. No, I think it's very important. It's like a guerrilla action. So it's like mm. completely two different uh, uh, scale, degree, uh, span. Uh, and you are putting it in the context of decolonizing. And I, I, I have a bone to pick, not that it's the most important thing in my mind, but I think all other aspects you have discussed between Rubaika, yourself, mm -hmm. and Vincent about decolonizing. So I will be the note of dissent here. See, we, yeah, we agree on few um, keywords whenever we mention decolonizing, right? I mean, in terms of archiving. It will be open access, it will be a uh, transparent process of collection, and the uh, process of collection will be part of the material uh, presented, is copyable, is multiple annotations, minoritized uh, histories, and near relationship with documents and documented. This much we uh, agree upon, and we will really disagree. We will meet anybody who disagree with that. But actually, it starts from there. I mean, this much, after this much of, um, if it is, if this decolonizing archive means we are destabilizing the structure of prevalent knowledge or colonized knowledge, then how, I mean, how much emphasis is on the material and how much on the structure? And I think the fifth one is, really a great example for that. It is as much about the material as much it is uh, uh, as it is about uh, the structure. Without the structure, this material, either in the um, state uh, television channels archive or in any private archive, it doesn't make any sense. We know of many private archives in India, or in terms of cinema, I don't name it, but everybody can recognize it, which actually privatized material which was public material, which was available in public place, artifacts regarding cinema, uh, which has been completely privatized. Now they are um, they're not accessible, which was accessible in Chol Bazar very easily. But anyway, so, so some kind of personal archiving can also be actually part of colonizing in a way or privatizing. So my, I mean, all the projects that you talked about, and including um, uh, Vincent's project, and um, of course, Import-Export, and Arsenal's various activities on film archiving, because they want archives to be alive, to be uh, related to performances, to related to um, actions. And we all learned a little bit of action-oriented archiving from yeah. Arsenal, all of us. And I, but I would, still say that primarily dealing with amnesia, primarily dealing with the task of bringing material, films, images, which have been obscured by various reasons. That, so that material is the, is the task, right? Now here, but the question is that when we don't do that, 
uh, when that is the, when it is come to something as as very localized, very day to day, very contemporary, something like majlis. And Majlis worked very, I mean, all of you may know, I mean, some of you may know, worked actually from 1990 to 2016. It's very important. 1990 is two years before Babri Masjid demolition. 2016 is two years after Narendra Modi became the prime minister. So that period is a very special period, which is not this time, but it is a contemporary time. It's past, not really past, but it is a contemporary which is not really contemporary because Narendra Modi is in power for almost 10 years now. So it's another, we are in, entered another time zone. So when you try to archive that, you are not really dealing with amnesia, nor are you dealing with, because it is in our present time. I mean, the people that one is talking about to Majlis archive, more or less, I mean, there are people who born after 1992, but more or less you're talking to people whose uh, personal experience is this. There, then the task is that if images, moving images, I'm not talking about films, because mm -hmm. film uh, is not a film archive, uh, it's moving image archive. So if it is moving image that you want to um, put, put in the public circulation, that means you think that it has political potential. Otherwise, there's so many moving images. I mean, you don't deal with all moving images, right? So the political potential of a particular moving image, now all potential is not positive potential. All political potential of an image is not, we know that we pay a price on it every day in India today, that all potential, political potential is not a desirable potential. I'll give you an example, and that example is very close to fifth wall also, and for my personal life also. Babri was a demolition image. Now, 1992, I made a film where um, I couldn't go, and I didn't know uh, Navina had already shot Babri Masjid demolition. So I shot it from a television news. Television news was showing this, and we just shot it off the screen. And it was part of that film. I live in Vairampara, which became a cult film later on. After 10 years, I was making another film on visual cultures in India. And I was looking for a real image, because according to me, that image was not a real image. It was of the television, of Babri Masjid demolition. So I went to everybody who more or less was known that collect documentary images. Uh, and everybody said, what? You are asking us. We all take it from your film. I said, but I've never gone to Ayodhya. Till today, I've never been to Ayodhya. They said, no, but in your film, there is an image. I said, OK, it's a television news image. So they use it. And that is the time, actually, that is the moment I started getting interested in archive of moving image. That how it is within 10 years, it was erased from the public life. Very interestingly, after 15 years, it's back in, with vengeance in public life. Because the uh, regime wants to circulate it, because that time it was taken away in 20, 2002, I'm talking about 10 years after the demolition, it was considered as a sh shameful image for the nation that Babri Masjid was demolished. So it was erased. It was not available in public life. Now, today's regime decided, no, it's a moment of glory that we have broken Babri Masjid demolition. Now, it's very easy. You go and do on YouTube, you will get the images. Now, why we could not get it in 2002 and how those images have come back uh, in 2000, after 2014, and today it is an um, image of glory. So if you remember when we first did a preview of uh, the fifth wall uh, in last year, there was a question whether we show these images or not. One was that, you know, all this censorship and crackdown, we di didn't want to get into that controversy, but I also argued at that time that they show Babri Masjid demolition image now with a lot of pride. Unless we are in a position to completely undo that set uh, narrative that is now attached to Babri Masjid demolition image, unless we are confident that by showing that image, we can offset the whole narrative which is predecided, we should not do it. At least we should not join the bandwagon and we, also, we will show something else. We will have to think of some other image and some other narrative. I mean, I'll talk about uh, Document of 15. Now, Document of 15 
will invoke images of uh, um, Second World War, the way which is pre-decided. Now, no amount of archiving can upset that. We'll have to think of some other, I mean, by uh, using uh, stock footage of um, Second World War, uh, you cannot really now uh, counter this whole very unhealthy Semitism, anti-Semitism debate that is going on in um, German cultural scene. Or say, um, another, so this is Kashmir. We actually did a lot of work during, um, when Majlis was very healthy and doing a lot of work. Uh, we, um, we had an archive already because we did a lot of um, public culture work in uh, Bombay. So we uh, already had some hundred hours of material. Padma started with those material. But um, that is the time some Kashmiri artists told us, oh, everything is about Bombay. Bombay creates image, then you people um, preserve them, then people uh, use those images and make more images. So everything is all about Bombay and we don't exist. I, till then I have never been to Kashmir, not that I have been now. Uh, but uh, we decided, okay, we'll give you the support, you start collecting. It was 1990s and it was a very interesting time in Kashmir. Uh, Kashmir, digital um, technology came. Before that, um, image making was very expensive, so hardly Kashmiris were making images. Bollywood was making, and adventurers were making, and sometimes documentary filmmakers from India or mainland were making images, but hardly local people were making. So they took to digital technology like, I mean, I remember in 90s, uh, every small lane will have editing studios, more in number than in Bombay. It was quite fascinating, you know, there will be performances, small, small, you know, some comedy performance in CD and some news uh, item in CDs. Every um, Sunday, Saturday, Sunday with newspaper CDs will come. So a lot of uh, digital image production. So we thought, okay, we will collect this. Very innocuous, very, uh, in a way, a political thing because whatever is in public domain, we are just collecting. It was more like a carer that we will take care of it, we'll convert it, we'll put it in a hard disk and we'll take care of it. But news spread and people started giving us material. So once, these images that you see on the right is one, um, uh, one photographer who works with an Urdu newspaper uh, came with a full sack full of uh, hard copy photographs, actual photographs, not the negative photographs some 700 later on we um, counted, and said, take it. He said, what? He said, yeah, 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 these are the photographs which were actually printed in the front page of the newspaper for 10 years. So these are actually public place image. You are talking about public place image, there's nothing private about it. But if, and these are all taken by me, so I have the collection of it lying. But to Indian state, it will look like I have collected intimidating uh, material. So I'm scared to keep it, you take it. We said, are you sure we'll digitize it and we'll take the digital version? He said, I just don't want these photos in my house. So we brought them, but we don't know how to annotate. 700 images, I mean, those newspapers are not available. He was not available. And many of them, if you just make it accessible, in today's polit political situation, it will be very intimidating for them. So we tried to do, I don't know whether with this mouse I can handle it. Uh, so what we did, we tried to create an emotion. It's like a palimpsest or rather a um, copy or insinuation of a um, palimpsest that there are more, but it's very complicated situation. We want to share it with you, but you will have to do something. You will have, you'll have to make the journey to do it. You will not just get it with the click of an image. So, uh, I mean, it, how to do it? Oh, it. Okay, can you click? Yeah. Just click random, yeah, as if you were going through it. Yeah. So this is the back of the uh, uh, photo. When, when what you click, you don't really see that. You see something else, and you have to figure it out, what it is, what connects with what. I mean, do some work, and yeah. It's very, very little annotation, because we also don't know how to annotate it. Here I can't. Uh, 
Oh, yeah, the, you cannot. That is also the thing that you cannot, yeah. Okay, let's go to the main page. So like that, some of the images, out of the 700 images, and the text we have decided to erase, uh, to actually create that emotion uh, of, um, yeah, so material is not material, or, or old material is not old material. Not, not, everything is not as romantic as sepia. So that is one issue that when archive needs to be hidden, and that is part of the care work, and that is decolonizing, that um, it no, access, it, access is not such a great thing, not in all context. And that's what I'm trying to say, that we romanticize free access a lot today, but so does YouTube, and so does all the social media. So we need to rethink the concept of access. Even annotation, I mean, we think that if we uh, keep uh, provision for annotation, uh, that that's good enough. So, so, so social media, everybody is annotating the uh, contemporary all the time, morning to night. I mean, so that, that means we have reached a kind of heavenly uh, nirvana with, uh, with uh, technology and access. So this, the, I want to say that decolonizing, one is that you take it globally, you take it global north, global south, invader, invaded, um, settler, original. And we, there is a perverse decolonization which is happening in India and in many other countries, Brazil and many other countries today, where colonizing is using, uh, being used, decolonizing is being used for toxic patriotism. And all technology and all ideology, all, especially image culture, is being used for that. So when we talk about image archiving and decolonizing, we'll have to talk about 23 and not, I mean, of course, we'll have to talk about uh, 20th century and 19th century also, but we'll have to remember 23, 2023. That's it. Thank you very much. Oops. Now it's on. Now both are on. Thank you very much, Maru. Um, I, I would like to give you the opportunity to react directly so maybe we can we can go without this. We can share. Yeah. We also have this one. Yeah. 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 You know what was really interesting in Navina's film, the one on Bangladesh, it said the prize of freedom. And it said that uh, you know, it started off with uh, those uh, residents of Bangladesh saying that, look, we've got freedom and prosperity will come. And it was really amazing, 50 years down the line, in 2022, the per capita income of Bangladesh was more than India. So, I mean, you have something which is archived, which was made 50 years back, and look at the relevance that what they said came true. The second thing was uh, Navina in her last interview before we started the documentary, she says, look, any piece that you make, obviously there'll be a, a viewpoint. And so she says in a film that, look, I mean, I stand for something. That's the point of making the content that I am, and I'm sharing it. So what was really beautiful is that whatever be, uh, this is to answer your point of saying that uh, when you archive, I thought what was really fascinating and why it's a treasure trove, because this is stuff that has been very well documented by somebody who was exceptional, and it's available, and a dialogue is what it starts. You know, there'll always be two perspectives, and that's what Naveena also said. So to get the dialogue going, and uh, Vince, I wanted to ask you, uh, I think this is an amazing tool, and it's a living archive for education, for universities and liberal art, and the more you expose it, the more people get to know, the more they utilize this, the content that you have, the greater would be the engagement. So could you just share with us if uh, there is some thought of how you broad base it? I know that the next film is at JNU. Are you trying to engage with more universities? Is something similar being done at a global level? And if you could uh, give a perspective on that. Um, yeah, l let me answer that uh, sideways a little bit. We just completed the European project, the European network project on the, the post-war reconstruction, wartime de destruction and post-war reconstruction of public spaces across Europe. And the, in, in the terminology of project funding, the main delivery, the main output of that project is an archive much like um, the fifth wall. 
And we built that website, that resource, in such a way as to make it usable for uh, teaching at the secondary and at the tertiary level. And it's being implemented now, so that's an important part of the of the project. So the idea really is to get people to use these resources, resources in teaching across Europe, um, use them for for uh, research purposes. And I think um, the great thing about the English translation that uh, Goethe Institute so generously funded is that uh, we can now do the same thing with the fifth wall beyond Germany. Um, as Merle was saying, uh, she's already used it in university teaching. We're using it. Uh, we're going to use it more. Um, so yeah, I think there's a, there's a great potential there. Um, but I want to also reiterate Modu's point. Access per se is not great. We, we shouldn't engage in a context and history blind uh, enthusiasm uh, for access. Um, let me give you an, another example. There's a strong push, and justifiably so, to restitute the contents of anthropological film archives or the archives of visual anthropology to the source communities. And uh, we have a very large collection of films in Frankfurt which were shot over a period of 60 years almost, uh, observational uh, scientific films, uh, part of a behavioral research design. Um, they were pro mostly interested in gesture, but they did a lot of sound recording. And one of the case studies was in Namibia. And if you speak the language and listen to the sound recordings, what you get is a political history of Namibia in the post-colonial period. Uh, problem is, uh, the, the researcher wasn't terribly interested in what people were saying but he recorded it just for the sake of completeness. If you put that online, that sound archive, the security apparatus of the government of Namibia would use it as a source and track these people down, and it would endanger their lives. And that's one of those situations where you see, it's much like the, the case of Kashmir, you know? Uh, you have to be very careful what you do with this kind of material, and that you have a pho photographer who collected this incredible archive of newspaper images coming up to you and say, take this away, liberate me from the danger that that collection represents, um, tells you something about how specifically we need to look at and define uh, the conditions of, of archiving and what we do uh, with archival materials. So <clears throat> there's a great potential in these kinds of platforms, but they need to, I mean, it's part, part of the decolonization effort is to respect uh, the, the context of usage and, and origin. Yeah, I, I think just Madhu, want to yeah. uh, add just two things in the context of this. One is this, as a result, that photographer's name is not here. I don't know that I'm protecting him or I'm erasing him. It's, it's a very difficult decision to take. And either way you are wrong, or either way you have a reason to do it. So he's erased now from history forever, because he has given me uh, his uh, hard copies. And uh, I, I, my conscience is clear, it is up, at least its essence is up. I told people that it exists, but we... So it's also a kind of um, uh, protecting people, I mean, which archivists take on themselves, that they are the carer, which is true, they're the healer. There are some mad people who uh, go on making archives, right? Who, uh, archives are always made by some mad people who obsessively collect and um, almost like what we call in India bhakti, like every day you perform something thinking that one day world will change or God, in anticipation that God will come one day. You go on doing it and they are the archivist. But there is the problem also that then they become also the holder. Yeah. Because care, like, I don't know what I've done with this. Um, uh, I mean, I'm very, very tentative, and this is the first time I'm publicly talking about this page. I'm, uh, it was uh, only released um, last August, and this is the most delicate one. I always avoid it, but I thought today is the chance to talk about it, that I'm not sure we have done the right thing, and we'll never be sure, maybe. And uh, so there is a frontality of information culture today, which we get. That frontality has to be broken or questioned or countered wherever we can. Uh, so it's, it's, 
and that too is an art project. I mean, these artists need to uh, get into it. Yeah. Please, there is a reply. One, two. Okay. Other way around. Okay. Is it okay? Um, I'm just connecting the previous session and this. Um, and um, also speaking here, because I think it's a safe space to speak, <laughs> relatively. Um, so one of the ethical questions, apart from what um, uh, Madhu is really talking about, you know, I mean, what do you reveal? What do you conceal? And why? And how do you really resolve those kind of questions? Um, I also, ap apart from the information, I'm connecting it to using the archive as a methodology uh, for students of either history or, uh, you know, media, communication, whatever. Um, and I think there was a very subtle distinction that was made about the themes and the structure. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where Fifth Wall is at least giving us a model which is which doesn't give us a closure, you know, which, which is very interesting. But unfortunately, in most academic contexts, we, you are expected to kind of give a closure to yes. whatever theme or teaching that we are going to do. And I think, at least in India, we are paying a heavy price for that kind of pedagogy that most of us have been party to in institutional structures. So I mean, I've been part of that and uh, you know, I'm guilty, I guess, of all that. So how do we really kind of, um, I mean, I love the image, Madhu, of uh, you don't see the frontal image, but you see something else. Uh, which, I mean, how, how can we really make the archive um, speak of the now? rather than speak of something that happened at that time. That's only a takeoff point, and I'm sure um, Navina and all the work that Vivan does and- Exactly. You know, I mean, especially that. Vivan, I mean, because yeah. I think it re requires art practice. So archiving in action is not just an academic uh, task. It's, uh, it, it requires art practice, and there comes Vivan with his practice. So actually, it comes together here yeah. very importantly. Yeah, just a very short reply. Um, just as a comment, picking up on, um, just as a comment to picking up on some very important points Madhushri raised, um, I think it was remarkable to see your presentation, Madhushri, and, and to see what you're doing with the Majlis Archive because it really shows um, um, how long away the archival discourse has come from um, being about access to what you pointed out, that access is not the answer, maybe. Um, it can go completely the other way. And it reminds me of um, some of the writing that Edward Lisson has been doing for the longest time, talking about a right to opacity <laughs> and saying that it's not actually even possible and not ethical to make oneself fully legible. And legibility is not the aspiration here necessarily. And therefore, instead of aspiring for transparency, which is not possible, which is imposed, and we know the, the, the problems that lie therein, how does one think of a, a politics of opacity? Um, how does one think about a, a politics of, um, of, uh, not, of acknowledging what is not uh, captured, of acknowledging what is absent, of acknowledging the fragmentariness. And I think just rounding up to where we are now, it almost feels like, you know, if you attended any seminar or symposium around archives a decade ago even, uh, the most predictable question was, would be, what did you not digitize? What, has, what is missing from the archive? You know, and it basically talked about or acknowledged the finitude of the archive, that it's never fully complete. It's not possible to be complete. And I think the question we're faced with now, which another philosopher, a, a trans philosopher, Paul Preziado asks, is um, not so much about can, 
can everything be archived, but rather, can the archive ever be destroyed? And what does that even do when there's this excess of toxicity as well? And does that ever go anywhere? Yeah. What, what does yeah. one do with the residue, the toxic residue, yeah. not necessarily the, the emancipatory one? So I think, I think this project really makes one think of this. Yeah. But uh, just to um, add to you, uh, I mean, this is my favorite, and I know. every <laughs> uh, meeting I mention this, uh, especially in the context of Hip Tual, is this film by, um, Romanian film by Andre Uzika and Harun Faruqi called The Autobiography of Nikolai Ceausescu, uh, which is made, it's a three hours long film, not a frame outside this from the state archive which is the official, you know, like our films division archive. And uh, there was no subversive image. They are all very frontal, informative propaganda images. Uh, and the filmmaker does not edit it to create any subversive moment into it. But he does something else. And for three hours, you watched it. It's very interesting. I watched this film. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very fond of this film. I've watched it many times. But the first time I watched it with Navina in Hamburg, <laughs> in a film festival, and I had no clue because it is like, it is European politics. Mm. Chichesco lifetime is post-war Europe, right? And I could not get in because I cannot recognize, and no, no commentary, no text, no card, nothing. Thank God, Navina Sundaram, nobody could have been better, was sitting next to me and giving me the commentary. Now he is going to Russia, now he is going to America, now he is going to South uh, Korea. And, but that film is all toxic propaganda images. I mean, I mean, whenever I watch Modi, and I think one day the, such a film will be made in <laughs> India, is that um, it worked fantastic. By the end of it, he was so tired of toxicity. Apparently, uh, Faruqi used to say that um, 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 piled up toxic images so high that they will destroy itself. They will de 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 destroy the whole toxic city culture of it. Uh, I don't know. I mean, we may fail in many such mm -hmm. projects, but this is one success project that is uh, autobiography of Nikolai Ceausescu. Maybe one day we'll make such a film. Yes, Uh, of course, I'm reminded after listening to you, Madhu. Um, uh, I'm reminding of a slightly reminded of a slightly anecdotal thing which happened in 2004 or something. Uh, I was uh, wanting to look at the material and the archive of Seva, which is Self-Employed Women's Association, and you know a lot of people from all around the world come to study their model and how they, you know, all these women take took agency to make their own films and um, Ella Bhatt and her, and heard about her, uh, the success of her trade unionist model, etc. So I was in Ahmedabad in a very small office which I had gone and found out where it was in a small room and it was uh, approaching lunchtime. So I just arrived there and I said I want to see some work and you know for me I was one of the many people who just you know, come by the dozens to look at work. So they very indifferently said, okay, that's the room. Here are the videotapes. Uh, sit and have a look. And, and that afforded me the opportunity to be a, a fly on the wall for that, uh, for that time. So lunch comes lunchtime and all these women from different walks of life, uh, I don't even know what all, but it was quite, you know, uh, remarkable to see. There was a banana seller, Othele Me Kele Bechte Bahar, she was there, there were many others, and they were sitting on the floor, they put their lunch, or they were like sharing lunch, different kind of things, and they were having this conversation, and one said to the other that, you know, we've got a donation from some American institute, uh, and they've given this editing suite. Um, so, the uh, Taylor Wali asked uh, uh, what, and the person said, it's Final Cut Pro, and uh, I mean, it was delightful to hear the person who ostensibly the banana seller who's part of making the films and not only but she said oh that FCP is not good enough ask them to give Avid so I, I you know so 
for, for me, it is a, uh, you know, this is a kind of example. If people ask me to talk about feminism and big institutions, I think these are the kind of things which sometimes are left on the sides, but quite delightful, I thought. Nice romantic anecdote, but not so uh, uh, neat, but anyway. Um, uh, you, uh, we were handling a very delicate question in, in relation to archives that is caretaking. So um, I, I really wonder, and this is uh, a question to both of you, maybe um, my last question for today. Um, how do we deal with this uh, also like luggage of caretaking which we carry? Um, um, so because you're right, I mean maybe archives should be destroyed. Some of them, at least. <laughs> yeah. Um, I really wonder, like, for example, the state archives, these national archives, the archives of power. How do we deal with this? What I do is I try to extract. I open the doors. I try to get access. I get these things out. Now I bring this back. Back. I bring this to India, as Navina wanted it and Vivan wanted it, and now I'm gone. <laughs> I mean, I go back to Germany and I leave this here. So um, at the same time, I have the feeling I have to protect this archive, but I, I want it to uh, get its own life. And this, uh, this is a question to both of you, um, uh, because it might be true in Nigeria, certainly in Palestine, certainly in many other places in the world, definitely true uh, here in India. Um, can we build uh, a transnational, um, Faroki called it a library of images. Can we build a transnational home for these independent archives, which is ki kind of safe. I mean, I, I'm really not sure in the digital sphere. And I, I would like to share this question with both of you, but also with you as the audience, because it's really, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about this all the time. Um, we haven't talked about money yet. <laughs> Maybe money. money. Uh, and funding and finances and that maybe that's the moment um, one way we convinced the German government agency to fund the creation of an archiving program in Nigeria is by pointing out that Nigeria actually does have a film industry and that the, the, this is a film industry and structural consolidation and going forward there will be an actual market for people with archiving skills and that we can anticipate a moment where <clears throat> this industry, and we're already seeing that actually happening, because right now Nollywood is producing a wave of remakes and they're referencing films from 30 years ago, where the past becomes a capital for the industry. <clears throat> Hollywood has been operating on, the, of, on, on a model of extracting value from its own past for about half a century now. The most valuable thing in Hollywood are rights catalogs. And um, a good part of the revenue and the fiscal stability of the industry comes from harvesting rights. Yes. Um, maybe the, it, it, it was a bit of a sleight of hand, but what our argument was we need to anticipate a state of the industry where that logic also comes into play. So we, we tried to pitch a humanities project as a <clears throat> an economic encouragement type of thing. We'll see whether that works out. But what I'm saying, what I'm trying to say uh, here is that absent solid funding from somewhere for that international bank of images, um, we probably have to think about guerrilla strategies of some kind uh, in order to really be able to build those uh, those those kinds of infrastructures. It's possible to build them. Um, Archive.org is an American example. It has Rick Prelinger's um, ephemeral film archive, which can be used and reused free of any any charge. But behind that is sort of an early generation of Silicon Valley millionaires. They're still millionaires because they're that old. Um, who invested in that infrastructure and they're actually maintaining it for public good purpose and not in order to try and monetize it. Um, so one of the challenges would be to build those kinds of networks um, 
with people who are not primarily engaged in an extractive logic when it become when it comes to uh, dealing with with digital images. Uh, most of what we're seeing is extractive, and it's dangerous to go down that road. Yeah, that's actually just a note to make. Navina, like in the film, so long as there are tears, worked with archival material, and we had to re buy this material mm -hmm. because she got it uh, for, uh, in the N NDR Times for TV, but it was not free for online. So we had to go to British Pate, who owns all this old footage, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I literally blackmailed this guy. I said, okay, if you don't give it me, to me for a good price, and this is 10 times less than you ask me now for, um, I will address this publicly, that we can't show this part of the film because um, British Pate didn't sell it to us for non-profitable um, reasons. I mean, we don't want to sell anything. We just want to show it. So that worked, actually. So yeah, there are ways to do this, but it's quite a just, just for the sake of illustration, one additional example. The BFI recently catalogued, inventorized, and digitized the complete remaining set of films uh, from the Colonial Film Unit. Tom Rice, who's a fantastic colleague at St. Andrews, was in charge of that project. And then the BFI, because they're under pressure from the Tory government and need to monetize everything when they were done, sold the material to Associated Press. Mm -hmm. And if you want to use any of it, yeah. you have to pay Associated Press's fee. Mm -hmm. That material belongs to the places where it was shot. Yeah. And it should be accessible in this case for views of any kind, free of charge, but that's just not happening. But that is a consequence of a specific economic policy directive from a right-wing government in Europe. Last word. No, no, last <laughs> word. I'm not much of a, uh, I'm guerrilla warfare kind of a person, no? so uh, about uh, uh, archive admin and um, actually I don't have much to say I mean uh, because Vincent is working or uh, Ashish is sitting here they're working at a much larger scale and um, archive which will sustain I'm more interested in archive as an intervention guerrilla intervention mm -hmm. make it it's an action people are involved it's, it's, a, it's a art piece uh, so that's my model all models are valid uh, and um, in that context, I would say that, um, uh, you know, it already happened with text or say ideology. Now we do, or say nation. You know, these are the things which are like whole, which are like complete. We knew what nation is, especially mm. post-colonial countries knew what nation is because we gave a lifetime. Gita is sitting here, give the lifetime, all the best time of your life to nation building. And today that's getting punctured which may not be such a bad thing. We are rethinking. Look, when you said, no, in uh, transnational archive, it is in your point. I was thinking that, am I interested in a transnational thing? I'm, I'm not sure of my own nation. Uh, and now what, I'll have another uh, relationship with another nation who I don't know that they're sure of their nation or not. What is nation today? Same happened with ideology. I, I, you know, when you were young, 70s that was, we were very sure about our ideology, whatever we understood of that, we were very sure of it. We are not anymore. I mean, as time is passing by, many such wholeness in our life, nation, ideology, are getting disintegrated or get, getting liquidated, which may not, which is very unnerving because suddenly at the last leg of our life, we don't know what to do. But it's, it's also quite exciting. I would say, can you do that with image? It's happening with text. That is an image, is an image. It's, it's, it's th that's it, I mean, moving image, especially the frame. Can we puncture it? Can we make holes? Can we drill it? Then only this transnational or network of image libraries will make sense. If we think image is a square frame or a rectangular frame and this is it, and uh, narrative is out of that, you will have to extract the narrative out of it. You cannot uh, touch it. Then I, I'm, I'm, at least I'm not interested, because mm -hmm. I'm very little. No? I'm not interested in that kind of admin work uh, of archive. Uh, so we'll have to think that moving image for too many, for too long because of this frame structure, no? Moving image is not touchable. You cannot, you don't interview the moving image. You do something out of it, which is blasphemous. 
it is, is taught uh, as that is blasphemous to puncture a moving image. Some master has made it and you cannot do anything about it. Or it's truth, because it's documentary image, so mm. it's truth. And you don't puncture truth. Who are you to puncture truth? You're not God. So, um, otherwise, I think we'll go round and round and make moving. Moving image archive is uh, different from other archives. That's what I'm trying to say. It's very true. Is there a last comment from the audience, someone who would like to add something which has not been said today or not been asked today? Mm -hmm. Ashish has not said anything. Ashish, why are you <laughs> running away? <laughs> I can also pass the microphone. Um, I just want to know from you, because I think this is a, for me, very important part, and maybe you feel similarly about it. Um, I uh, registered an account when the website launched, and I immediately watched the extra dry uh, stuff, <laughs> yeah. because of course I need to. And so I wanted, <laughs> I wanted to hear about the humor that is there. I mm. mean, we saw the clips, uh, and even in, you know, uh, uh, horrible after Civil War uh, times, uh, then it's still the uh, police president got uh, an elephant from the army and now we're here to celebrate and it's like this dryness in there I mean even this uh, like very hard political situation there is a moment because I have seen the satirical content that she produced yeah. um, that it's just like uh, yeah I could see even the humor here like in all the uh, documentary stuff would you care to comment on that yeah. that is Nabila Sundaram's wicked sense of humor and a very vantage position that she was in. Uh, she was European by all practical standard. Okay, more European than most Europeans. But she was also, as she said, Nehruvian child. And a very particular time she has grown up in India. I mean, believer in nation. Um, those are the heydays of nation building. And uh, so that vantage position and that training that that Luke has given her a uh, sense of humor, which is not humor, which is satire, as you say. But uh, she also had a style uh, of humorous style. So all these things together. Yeah, you are right. It's throughout there is another line runs, another narrative runs. And she complained all her life through that the Germans would not understand yeah. this kind of humor. Yeah. They just couldn't follow it. It's too fine. It's too, oh, no. Oh. You know, she has this wonderful laughter which is like a comment and yeah. when, when sometimes when she says something very serious she adds this laughter where which uh, which uh, gives it a really interesting note ashish you started this evening and uh, would you like to close it also no <laughs> thank you so can, can i say one last thing yes of course <laughs> i mean as a, as a film scholar and a former critic, I feel obliged to say that I think that Novino Sundaram is the most under-canonized major documentary filmmaker in Germany of the last 50 years. I think one thing that we have to acknowledge when we see these films is they're terrific films. Mm -hmm. She's someone who has an impeccable sense of rhythm and can construct the narrative, uh, has an incredible eye for, you know, the, the perspective, the, re the right objects in the right time. The films are extremely carefully and, 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 and intelligently edited. Um, the, 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 the West Sahara thing, for instance, the whole thing about the, the extractive infrastructure there, that is just good filmmaking. And uh, one thing that we also can learn from this and as films, I'm, I'm I've invested my professional life in doing non-canonical stuff, but here I would reverse course and say uh, we should acknowledge that she belongs up there with Froki and a few others. Thanks a lot, because that's very true. Thank you all for being with us for such a long time and for sharing this uh, afternoon with us. Thank you both for sharing this with me, and thank you very much to our host organizations. I really would like to thank SSAF for 
making this possible along with Goethe Institute because um, this is really, for me, I mean, I wasn't expecting this. Seeing it all with English subtitles is really a step out into the world and there it shall be now. Thank you. Yeah, it's time to say thank you. I would like to do this as well. First of all, thank you very much, everybody, for coming here today. And I would also like to thank you, Merle, Merle Kröger. I would like to thank um, Rubaika Jaliwala one more time, Madhu Sridatta and Vincent um, Hediger. Um, thank you also to Shergil Sundaram Arts Foundation, to Vivan Sundaram, Gita Kapoor, and the team Gayatri Upal, Latika Gupta, Surav, and Malavika. I would also like to thank uh, my colleagues Farah, Kanika, Shweta, Nidi, Salim, and Nawaz for having this here today. And I just want to mention that today is actually the India premiere of this archive. And from now on, Merle will travel to other cities here, in India, to Bangalore, to Pune, to Mumbai for similar events. So please spread the word to your friends who are over there to make them come to the events. And yeah, thank you one more time for being here. And I would like to invite you to a reception on the terrace. Thank you. <laughs>